and um, to another weekly online Neurotech San Francisco Hack Night, uh, which is, of course, a misnomer. Um, but uh, we are meeting um, May 14th, and um, I'm going to jump right in. Um, I don't, well, we will give anybody who's a newcomer would like to introduce themselves. Sure. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not really a newcomer. Wait, I'm unmuted, right? Yeah. Uh, not really a newcomer to the meetup, but I haven't been online. I haven't been to the online version of the meetup, and I haven't been really active uh, in the neurotech scene for a while. But uh, I mean, at least in this group, uh, my name is Paul. Um, I'm currently traveling. Uh, well, I was traveling until COVID hit and uh, working on my own uh, app. It's not related to neurotech. It's a AI powered video editor, which um, if anybody's interested in learning more, I can talk about later. But before this, last year, I was working at Facebook on their uh, BCI project. So I actually had a fair amount of exposure to, to that stuff recently. Um, I was, if anybody's not familiar, I assume most people have heard about it, but in case anybody doesn't know, it's basically a headset that uh, attempts to do like thought to text. So you think a sentence and then it, it you know, it reads the brain signals, decodes that, and tries to print out exactly what you're saying uh, in an unconstrained manner. Um, I can't really talk like too, too much about details of that stuff since it's kind of like, uh, you know, private work, uh, you know, I'm still under NDA and stuff, but I can just, I, I can say, it's not it's not gonna happen soon <laughs> there's a uh, it's a very challenging problem uh, probably as anybody in the field knows it's, if it sounds like it's impossible it's uh, you know it's not necessarily impossible but it's, it's pretty close it's, it's a very difficult problem so um anyways there's that and before that i had some uh, i was work i worked at ucsf before that also in um kind of like medical imaging more like doing applications development but around uh using fMRI uh, to, to kind of build like applications to support research in dementia and stuff like that and uh, other stuff. Anyways, I'm a developer. Nice to meet you guys. Is Facebook doing anything uh, open source or is it purely private? Uh, it's all private so far. Uh, yeah, as far as I know. Yeah. I mean, maybe if it was invasive or non-invasive BCI? <laughs> the yeah, so the product obviously is non-invasive. Is, is something that they, this is all public that, that they want you know anybody to be able to use. So it's not like for specific stuff. Uh, but I can say also they have a lot of collaborations with other groups, and like in particular the part that I worked on uh, was uh, a collaboration with UCSF as well. So there was a little bit of uh, invasive stuff that was going on there in that collaboration. But it's not like stuff that's directly going to be used on their product. It's just kind of like. Um, additional research to kind of help them better understand like the problem and how to go about doing it, um, stuff like that. So is, is that product going to be hardware or software? Like, can you, is that going into the NDA space? Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it'll be a hardware project, a product eventually. If it ever makes it to, you know, to market, it would be a, a hardware product uh, with oh, right. their own proprietary EG. software on it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's not, it's not quite EEG, but yeah. I yeah. think I think Facebook's presented two years ago at a Zilomar BCI conference, and it's based on light scattering. Yeah, that's right. Oh, right. Just a sec. FD. Somebody is saying that they can only see a black screen. Um, does does maybe you've got your video turned off? Talking to me? Uh, no, no, sorry. That's uh, uh, for for Nick. Um. Anyway, sorry. So you 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 knew you were going to get a bunch of questions, right, Paul? <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> I'm not be able to answer all of them, but the ones I can, I can answer. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I I was pretty. Uh, I think it was like in March where I saw. Um, Who's the uh, the FNIRS guy? Mark uh, Mark something at Facebook. It's like Chevalier. No. Yeah, that was my boss, Mark Chevalier. Okay. Yeah. 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 And um, and then I realized that that Facebook was was sponsoring the the NIRS meeting in um, uh, October. And uh, and I was like, oh wow, okay. And then I see that Colonel's built a uh, uh an afnir system too <laughs> and um uh yeah. it's it's a good time to be in nears 
Yeah, it seems like it's, you know, it's a bit more reliable than EEG. I think a lot of people have, have uh, just given up on trying to do anything too, too useful with EEG. Um, yeah. I've seen like a couple interesting studies, like, you know, I still got like the stuff that like Christian Coates and them are doing down there, but um, I don't know. I haven't actually kept up too much with the research and even so, so since as I was only working there until last November. So since then, I also don't have any updates on how that is progressing. Sure, sure, sure. Well, um, uh, why did you why did you leave? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, well, <laughs> I actually well, yeah, it was really interesting stuff. But uh, you know, there were obviously. Um, like, I guess I'd say the primary reason is just I wanted more freedom to do my own thing. So I can now I'm, I'm working on my own project, and I have a kind of total creative freedom over that. Uh, there was also like a little bit of you know, frustration in making progress, I guess. We were actually making progress, but, uh, you know, so obviously the goal was still pretty far away and stuff like that. Uh, but I would say the main reason is just that I wanted to do what I'm doing now, which is kind of traveling and uh, having the, the freedom and flexibility to work on exactly what I want to do um, instead of like filling a specific role in the project, you know, that I had to do. Sure, sure, sure. Well, um, uh, thank you for introducing yourself. And, um, uh, I'm just going to see. Huh. Um, I'm just just seeing if I can help Nick here. You can't hear us. Here, let me just try. Um, well, if, uh, if I could switch over and, um, John, are you still, uh, Chibuk, are you still with us? So, uh, yeah, I yeah. Think you thick. Okay. Okay. And, I'm um, uh, so if you don't mind, uh, introducing yourself and, um, I'm just helping somebody with their, with getting on the, the meetup here. Okay. Uh, I don't see you yet. Uh, there we go. You guys see me now. It's really dark in here, but <laughs> <laughs> no worries. You try to see it. <laughs> it. It is. It is nighttime there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey guys, uh, I'm John. I started a company called Blueberry. Uh, we're going on an FNIRS product. Uh, basically, it's FNIRS in the temple of a pair of glasses. Uh, so this is the current version of the product. Um, not sure if you can see. Uh, but basically, the FNIRS sensor is along the inside of the temple. Yeah. And we have two photodiodes. Uh, maybe if I... Uh, there. You can see it now. Uh, yeah. So an array of LEDs uh, at the front. And then uh, two uh, photodiode placements for picking up the signal back. Um, and then we have this uh, kind of interesting uh, projection of a light forward uh, to give you a live status of uh, kind of your mental oxygenation state uh, in like a period of time. Hello, can anyone hear me? Yeah, yeah Nick. Yeah. We can hear you now. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, John. Um, yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, so big single channel F nears, one location. Basically, oh, so it's, it's just on the left side. Just on the left side right now. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. We've done some prototypes for like left and right, but for like costs, getting it to market quicker, it's like gotcha. one side. <laughs> um, we've done like a bunch of designs as well to make it into like a bit of like a pod format as well. Sure. Uh, uh, so then, then people can place it in like a headband or like something like that perhaps sits in different locations uh, gotcha. for, depending on their use case. Um, and, and what's what's the interconnect with those those pods? Say that again. Um, and uh, how how can you connect to those those pods if you were going to yeah. use your own headband or? Oh, for sure. Um, so it's it's all like a Bluetooth low energy. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, and, um, and 
And how, how do you charge them? Uh, it's micro USB. Gotcha. Uh, so trying, to, trying to keep those like uh, widely accessible things as possible. Um, and the early units will also have like a JTAG connector <laughs> on them. So um, for like the more hackerish type people, they could probably figure it out. <laughs> uh, probably like read off the spy uh, connection through the JTAG interface as well. Um, if they really wanted gotcha. to. Gotcha. Uh, so, <laughs> right. And and um, have you have you tried to use uh, a bunch of those in a in a headband? Um, we uh, the most we've done so far is two. As I mean, so, um, we haven't done uh, more than that. Uh, one uh, a fellow we started work with, uh, Caden is his name. Uh, he actually just open sourced uh, tonight uh, a repo which connects multiple blueberries and the Muse headband. Uh, simultaneously. Very cool. Um, uh, do you have a, um, uh, yeah, do you have a link to that? Yeah, I'll send it. Please. Yeah, you can drop it in chat or in Slack. Um, sorry, I'm just uh, trying to help Nick here. Yeah. Um, I have a question, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Um, are you able to com comfortably fit both the Muse and the glasses on your head? Uh, so what we actually did with uh, the Muse is we popped the module off and placed it on the inner part of the muse that been at the back. Um, like kind of right before the ear part? Exactly, yes. Okay, interesting. And were yeah. you able to fit that into uh, kind of like the Muse or the Muse 2 models or did you slide that into the Muse S? Uh, that was the Muse 2 model. Uh, cool. Uh, yeah, it, it was the Muse 2. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay, very cool. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and it was just kind of sitting along the like the upside right before, uh, so that the ground contacts uh, still like made contact with you for the electric. So back to you. Um, Can I ask a question as well? I'm just curious. So, uh, what kinds of applications are you thinking about uh, doing with uh, with your device? Um, really, we've been trying to get to like a fatigue kind of a. Uh, a measurement to help people understand when to take a break. That's the main application that we've been looking at, uh, specifically the kind of people that are in a knowledge worker context with high, high stress and are trying to like better understand their workflow. Um, that's like the main context that we've been iterating on for the past like three or four months. Um, we've done like a bunch of other experiments in like esports and uh, kind of more like sporting uh, kind of context or like player performance. Um, but from all of the kind of like customer or like end customer discovery, uh, we found that if we can actually create a positive impact in a person's kind of like day to day management of their stress during a working day, uh, that'd be really beneficial. So kind of keeping going down that road um, until we see some sort of indicator to change otherwise. <laughs> um, cool. Thanks. Yeah, nice. yeah that's, that's uh, it's, uh, kind of kind of like, um, or you know, what, what are you doing in terms of a software rollout to accompany this? Uh, so we've got mobile apps right now. OK. Uh, uh, Android and iOS that have this kind of experience that enables a person to either uh, get real-time feedback through the mobile app or set up the device to work without the, the mobile app completely so you can kind of turn the device on uh, synchronize the data at the end of the day and then get like a, a report after eight hours of what happened with your gotcha. blood oxygenation across the eight hours sure 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 yeah, I mean, you know, that is certainly a pair of glasses is a is a different kind of a, it's a kind of a perfect form factor for for long term use and uh, and yeah, um, certainly for that one spot, I I assume that um, uh, you don't have any hair problems with that. Uh, we have found that there's most issues with people that have you know this like. Uh, I have like really like kind of outward hairstyles. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes there's a challenge there. Okay. This okay. Girl, I guess a for instance of that would be um, perhaps the like 
the dynamic range of what we might be able to capture for like a chemodynamic response for someone like that might be a third or a quarter of what you might get someone that has like very little hair or is bald. So, gotcha, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Okay. John, is my hair getting too outward for this device now? <laughs> <laughs> it is thin, since you stuck your finger in the plug socket. <laughs> yeah, is that, is that gel? <laughs> nice pal. <laughs> That's, That's awesome, John. It's looking really good. Um, can like so it's not um. What are you projecting onto the lens or what's going on with the feedback oh, to the user now? Uh, so it's uh, it's a little fiber optic cable that uh, shoots out an LED so right. that when you glance in the top left corner of your field of view, you yep. see this light. And is that shipping with uh, a single color LED or can you change the color? Yeah, it's an RGB. Cool. And can you, you control it? Uh, so you can control it yeah. or the device like onboard classification can control it. So we could try to use that for experiments. Oh yeah, hundred percent. So so, so I, <laughs> I did I did mention Kyle that we we brought up uh do you have your um those Smith uh those Smith glasses? Um, yeah, probably. So I didn't haven't left my house in two months. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, uh, you know, John, I, I mentioned this when we when we talked on, on Messenger, um, yes. you know, that, uh, I mean, I, I love your rollout. And so I don't want to be talking about new features, but uh, <laughs> but I, I didn't realize that you also had an LED. So so that light, yes. um, can I can I flicker that light? Yeah. Yeah. So like one, so like one. Uh, indication that we have that goes off is let's say the trend line for oxygenation is indicating yeah. like higher stress. Yeah. You will, like blink white, blue, white, blue, white, blue five or six times as like an indication to take a break. Okay. And you okay. don't need, yeah, like that's just kind of like a. Well, uh, I mean, I'm, 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 you know, it's not, uh, not ideally placed, uh, but I'm, I'm also wondering, you know, if I could use that for come like a steady state VP. Uh, yeah, potentially. But. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that would be, that would be the ideal. I mean, I always thought that, that would be the, the coolest thing about like AR glasses that, yeah. you know, were also connected to uh, an acquisition system is that you can oh, so use the glasses for the stimuli. Yeah. 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 Use the, um, use them for, for a steady state, uh, uh, you know, because like at Smith Kettlewell, we were just using an LED. You know, LEDs give you the like perfect timing at any frequency you want, right? And yes, um, exactly. Uh, so it's it is pretty cool. You might want to. I mean, there we were just putting them inside like a um, a ping pong ball to to give it kind of uh, kind of diffuse it and make it a little less harsh. We get work glasses yes. like this, and um, we embed uh, LED strips for our like mobile skateboard study that we're doing now. No way. So That's... yeah, same idea. The it's um, LEDs are the future. Damn straight. Damn straight. <laughs> so so you are you doing? Like you doing SSVPs on a skateboard? No, that's cool. But no, we just uh, I do the same boring oddball task in every experiment. <laughs> the, um, but no yeah you we it's like uh you it's an attention task um but i like the idea of it built right in with the hardware so that you can kind of stream and control the timing without the raspberry pi yes yeah 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 um you so, doing, sorry to interrupt no go go uh, ahead. i have to, I have to ask kyle this because <laughs> but guys you doing oddball on the skateboard <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, oh my goodness! Are you doing auditory oddball on the skateboard? Because I wanted to know how you what what, what how are you doing the timing for that? How do we? Um, sorry, my my got kicked out. How, how are you laying the triggers down, or how are you kind of tracking the the stimuli? Oh yeah, the uh, we use a Raspberry Pi and use the pins of the Raspberry Pi to. Okay. both send into the 
parallel port of the amplifier and uh, drive the LEDs or the, we use the headphones from the Raspberry Pi to present auditory stimuli. Got it, got it, okay, cheers. So John, are you, does it have its own microcontroller on it or like, yeah. Yeah, it's an M0. Yeah. yeah, it's M zero. Um, yeah, it's uh, the the company that's making it is called uh, Dialog Semiconductor. I'm not sure if you've heard of them before, but they're um, they're a Netherlands company, but they're the primary supplier of microcontrollers for the Xiaomi uh, bands. Um, oh, okay, what are what are those? Uh, so. It's called Dialog Semiconductor. Is the microcontroller we're using? It's an R, like it's an ARM M zero uh, sure. architecture. But okay. um, yeah, they just have a really good uh, low energy profile. And yeah, it just works. And and you know, like like Kyle's saying, uh, LEDs are the are the future. Um, so yes. I, I take it that your power is your your power draw is still super low. I mean, like, how long can you take oh. a charge? Uh, so right now, this lasts when it's not streaming data. Uh, it'll mm. record on the device for about uh, 10 hours. Gotcha. With the little battery we have, it's like 130 milliamps. Mm. Um, and then if you're streaming over Bluetooth, it's wow. about four right now. Mm. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. What's can this? I, oh, sorry, Mike. I, go ahead. I just wanted to argue that um, micro LEDs, super bright, high density micro LEDs are the future. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear it's plastics, so. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, or like, uh, have, you guys heard of a, have you guys heard of a company called Plessy Semiconductors? No. no. Oh, you guys got to check these guys out. They're out of the United Kingdom and they're doing like some really interesting stuff with high power OLED displays. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Well, that 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 I can that I can certainly believe. Is uh, um do you have photo detectors? Is that what the light detector is? Uh yeah, yeah, so they're two photodiodes. Yeah. And oh, so they're they're tuned to the two wavelengths of light? Uh no. Uh, no, they're like they're wide spectrum photodiodes, Got and then okay. just the uh, just the timing of the pulse of the LEDs is timed to only pick up like one response from each photodiode. Right, and then what's the sampling rate to get through a full cycle of both? Or yeah, uh, so the like the the true sampling rate right now, we've tried 512 and 256 uh, samples per second, mm -hmm. and then done like averaging across those uh, to try and get some, you know, general noise reduction. And are you averaging that on the chip or you're, are you broadcasting raw data from the device? Uh, so there is averaging on the chip and there's also some like really rudimentary filtering being done in the firmware right now, uh, but the raw data from the LEDs could be like. Sent I guess like you can get the heart rate, you can transfer the yep. data with the heart in it over Bluetooth. Yes, so either like calculate the heart rate on the device or just sample and get like a hundred samples per second, and you can see the pulse um, right. in the baseline. Yeah. And how do you make the optodes flush against different users' heads? Like the uh, yeah, good question. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess uh, it, I, that's the hard part. Don't know exactly yet. Yeah, uh, but the one thing that we've been experimenting with is this like uh, mechanical cusp. That basically, you know, like um, on the back of a on the back of the PCB, there's basically this like bit of like rubber pressure. So the natural indication is for it to be outward like this. Yeah. And then when it slides onto the person's head, it pushes it. Yeah, that's so you get perfect. this like 
a little yeah, bit of depression. Yeah, spring great. Yeah. yeah, you need something like that. That's great. Yeah, but yeah, I don't know how how well it'll actually work. But we have like the production production version. Like oh, here's here's the, yeah. So the <laughs> what about environmental light, John? Pardon? What about environmental light? Like, do you have any filtering into a narrow wavelength band or? Yeah. Uh, so, so actually, the photodiodes that uh, are used have built-in ambient light uh, noise cancellation. Cool. I think it's eight fifty nanometers are automatically removed. There's automatically. Removed. Yeah. Great. And and so your your Kickstarter run is is finished. Yeah, that was done in the uh, uh, beginning of April. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And and how did that work for you? I mean, is that, uh, uh, you know, was this your first Kickstarter? Uh, no, I, I've done them before. So this oh, okay. Is, uh, uh, this is my first actually, like, successfully cross-goal Kickstarter. Though. Okay, so, awesome. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other ones either had like too high of a goal, not enough marketing spend, lots of like different things. Uh, this one was really about just sell 50 and then ship them on the timeline that is expected. <laughs> so we're actually on, track to actually, actually on track to get them shipped as like effectively an early unit to people in August. Because um, we have functional things now. We'll do the EMC testing and then ship them out. <laughs> That's it. That's and who, who are your customers? Do you know? Are they all devs or who are the customers? Are they all devs or? Oh, the, uh, uh, no, it's the, it's actually, it's a weird split of, I would say people that are into like mindfulness and meditation and devs and the people that are in the like, interest in the mindfulness and meditation space i would say are more for like senior in their career so they're like in their like late 30s like mid 40s and they're probably like high up in a company somewhere um can, can i also ask a question about um so thomas edison he uh, tapped into a uh, hypnagogic imagery uh, and so the mit dream lab has built a device to, uh, to sort of support that i'm just wondering with your device is it possible to like stimulate some type of like visual images uh, that you know if you tap into a different state that the device you should build could trigger hey link it's could you get a little closer to your mic oh yeah okay D did uh, you did you catch that john i can uh, also repeat I, I, did you not hear yeah. me yeah well? no if you could yeah, get a little sure. closer to your mic yeah yeah, I'm calling from the simulation. It's like not good reception here. <laughs> no, I'm, just oh. <laughs> I'm just walking around here. Okay, I should have AirPods Pro. They should be good quality. So, okay, anyway. Um, I, was just mention I was mentioning Thomas Edison tapped into hypnogonic imagery uh, during the day. And the MIT Dream Lab has a device that kind of like facilitates that. Uh, because I think back in the day, you know, they would hold these devices that would like make sure like you don't fall asleep, but you're also not awake. Uh, so you can tap into that state. So the question I have is, with your device, can you uh, induce some type of visual imagery? Uh, and then if you're in a different state, then you could essentially have some type of imagery, right? That like the device that you have sort of um, it triggers. <laughs> Potentially, if it's actually causing you to, or if like the, the sequence of the stimulus causes you to enter that state, Right or like that kind of imagery causes you to be like, like activated into that end state. Um, but what is the like deep enough sequence that causes a person to result in that? I don't know. Or do you know, like what? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I find it fascinating uh, how we can use neurotechnology to change people's yeah. brain states, um, which should be increasingly possible. Yeah and should become also increasingly more visual and more like real reality. Um, and so I'm just wondering, yeah. I mean, obviously like there's a lot of open questions, but for something that you build, seems like something like that is feasible. Um, Potentially. 
because you, you mentioned like your target market is some people who like to meditate, right? I mean, meditation is nothing else than like a formless uh, st like space in which you can like detach yourself yeah. and like be observant about your thoughts. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering yeah. with how you're thinking long term, what's the vision of, of the project that you have? Um, even if the technology is not there yet or, or even if we can't right. do this today yet, but possibly in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like the, like this business was founded under the pretense of trying to improve the mental well-being of people in the context of attention, memory, kind of mind and body. The technology is completely like, subservient to that. So if we could accomplish the same thing with out an FNIR sensor and get an equivalent level result, I'd be all for it. I just haven't come across like a technology feedback loop that gives as good insight into mind and body as FNIRs, but I imagine there'll be a new technology in five years that will probably be better. Uh, we'll probably change to that. Um, yeah. So, uh, I guess oh, as long as the Can you measure yep. respiratory rate? Uh, yeah, we've noticed some like potential for respiration, right? Uh, over like uh, maybe like, like a five or 10 minute window, be possible. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be like a very nested average, right? It's not gonna be a, this is what the immediate respiratory rate is. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And the, the current price point is, is uh, $200? Yeah, it's yeah, two hundred. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean that's still. I mean that's that's great. Um, so, what are you hoping to? Um, well, you're 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 at shipping stage. You just wrapped this up, so <laughs> I don't want to. I, I think uh, what you're focused on right now in terms of shipping is uh, is is uh, is enough. Um, but I'm I'm curious if you've got what you've got planned for your next next project. <laughs> yeah, uh, it it should be interesting. We're kind of like in deep of like prototyping right now. Okay. Um, most likely, it'll be additional an additional like one inward and one outward sensor, most likely. Um, but not really exactly what the combination will be yet, and it'll probably still be in the glasses form factor. Okay. Um, just trying to get more context to the world around you and more internal context. Okay. Um, well, yeah. then, then can can we? Uh, uh, is it still possible to to pitch the uh, the old Muse uh, sunglass or uh, glasses um, and put an EG sensor in there so that you could have both? <laughs> yeah, potentially. Um, they, they, so what? What Kyle's got is he, what Kyle showed us last week was uh, having in the back yep. of the back of the glasses is uh, yeah, oh have you seen these okay I hadn't uh, we're yeah, all Canadian like, up here okay yeah yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> all the Canadians are familiar with there's all lots these. of neurotech flying around up in Canada yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, and it's not just Montreal huh? there's just garbage piles full of old. Um, that's great. You hired Caden, yeah. John. He's the he's the best. He's good. Yeah, he's hilarious. Some <laughs> of his ideas are great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I I saw you you posted this. Uh, did did you post it in the chat here? I just um, I you did I post, post uh, in Slack. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I posted in the Hack Night channel. Yeah. Here, here, yeah. yeah. That's cool. There you go. Yeah. Um, Does this work with old blueberries? Uh, the uh, what Caden did? No, because it's uh, that's what the the ones that you have, have uh, Kyle, are with an SPP protocol, and this oh, is yeah. uh, everything that we've done now is on low energy, or Bluetooth low energy. Have, yeah, have, have you looked at um, have you looked at the engineers from uh, David Boaz's lab? Uh, I have not. Uh, here, here's the. Uh, 
I'm, I'm just curious, uh, you know, not that you have to answer on the fly, but uh, if you have a chance to, to look at that oh. and see see what you oh, think. From, uh, oh, from, uh, from like open FNIRs. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah, I mean, like I, uh, when I was first starting to explore this, I actually reached out to someone on the Open, open F Mirrors team. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so I didn't realize yeah. that, um, uh, so Open Nears, which was the yeah. original project, um, uh, Alex Van, yeah. Alexander von Lohmann, and I might be mispronouncing yeah. that German name, but yeah, so he's, he's now in uh, David Boaz's lab at BU. And um, oh, okay, cool. And uh, yeah, the uh, he I posted this in the the open near Slack, but um, he's got a nice. Uh, it's actually a nice video. Um, okay. You can catch Alexander talking about um, mobile nears, and uh, okay, and you know these as as I'm sure you know, like they're they're focused on. Or you know, David Boaz's lab has a very long history in terms of uh, multi-channel NIRs and and doing yep. this at uh, re with research uh, perspective, um, where you're trying to pull out all kinds of physiological measurements from this. Um, but but I'm particularly interested in terms of you know, are there uh, as someone who's been looking at this in terms of just a single sensor. You know, are, is there is there any advice that maybe you would have looking at some of these hardware designs in in terms of uh, uh, how we could you know because these are these are open plans for for yes. researchers to build something that you know uh, yes. like a Hitachi system from uh, that <laughs> we yeah. partner with you know it's like three hundred thousand dollars you know and uh, yeah, for thirty two channels. Um, yep. and yeah, you know, and, um, so, you know, I love, I love engineers in terms of, you know, a potentially like a build your, a somewhat build your own system or, you know, certainly like yes. we can get enough, enough groups that are interested in fabrication. Um, we can get price down so that this is becomes a very accessible system. And like I saw in your, in the, the GitHub, um, Comments, you know, NIRS is really uh, a, a gateway into collecting fMRI like measures uh, of neural activity, right? And um, yep. and so, yeah, it, you know, if you haven't seen that, uh, definitely check it out. Um, I'd okay. be love to hear what your what your thoughts are um, at some point. <laughs> I mean, like, I guess the main insight that we've had over the past like 18 months is the electronics that exist today from like the analog front end, the photodiodes and the LEDs now make it possible to basically build a near system really quickly, really cheaply. A lot of the like magic or the like time gets yeah. built into the signal processing after you get the like integer value from the photodiode back <laughs> or the mechanical design to make it fit properly for your intended use case right um so right maybe like three years ago there wasn't as much availability to the actual high quality parts to make it work or be possible but now it is so that kind of opens up the door for a lot more devices to be made really low cost or you can buy like an analog front end tip, uh, analog front end chip from TI, let's say, and get it working really quickly, or from another company. Like it's cool. Yeah. Okay. Heart rate analog front end that's optical photodiode infrared sure. LEDs. Sure. <laughs> oh, sure. It works. Take take uh, care, John. Uh, sorry, John. John Nolte is just taking off, but um, thank okay. thank you, John. Yep. Um, that, that is, that's great to, I mean, it, it, it looks like it, um, 
you're you're actually doing it and of course the the, the one remaining problem that nobody's really solved uh especially with multi-channel yep. is how do you get all of those sensors to the head and get good signal <laughs> and you know uh yes. certainly you know it, it's it I mean, it's been 20 years since I've I've visited uh, Boaz's lab, but even back then they had so many different headsets, you know, and uh, any 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 multi-channel nears group has a lot of <laughs> weird headsets lying around. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I I hadn't actually seen the the in the Ninja Nears, He's got this uh, you know kind of mesh mesh cap. Um, uh, have you seen the um, the nears from uh, Gower Labs, the the Lumo? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 In that one. Yeah. yeah That's cool. Um, um, that's, uh, and there's so many coming out, but I mean, like that kind of makes sense, though. If you think as soon as these components uh, as they become available, it makes sense to build stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm just, let me just, rip, um, somebody else coming to the meeting here. Yeah. Uh, well, I know, um, it's late there on the East coast. And, um, so does anybody else have questions for John? I, I got a question, John. So what? What are you kind of looking for people to pick in on? Like what are the stuff you need to build it? So experiments you need doing? I'm just I'm just curious, like what are the things yeah, so, so suppose um you know we met up and worked on some stuff like we like to do. Yes. <laughs> um what kind of things yeah. are high up on your priority list for stuff you want to throw at people to try and figure out? Um, I, I think a lot of it right now is just taking sensor in like a specific situation and then seeing if there can be some discernible measure from that, from like a reference signal. So let's say, for instance, of that in this like Muse context, can we infer some correlation with NEARs with different uh, EEG kind of uh, modes of measure. So like alpha, beta, theta, gamma kind of thing. Um, and then what does that mean in the context of a breathing exercise or you reading at your computer or reading at your desk? Is there some uh, identifiable and consistent unit of measure that makes it uh, a qualified metric that we can actually say concretely we are measuring this and we're not just giving some like scoring system that is meaningless or is only like interpreted for like one or a few people. Have you, um, have you yeah. settled on a kind of paradigm for, you know, testing out the indicators for drowsiness alert signals that you, you're right. trying to develop? Like have you, Figured out what the thing is that you're yeah. going to do consistently. Um, so, like, uh, I guess one paradigm or like one, um, like, you mean like the mode of like testing? Yeah. So, like, rest, like, stimulus, rest, stimulus. Uh, so well, I was thinking more like the the drowsiness in the indicator or the kind of alertness thing. Like, have you, have you settled on the the uh, setup for kind of working and you know, figuring out the signal features in in the ex yes. in the kind of real world simulated real world context that you're interested in. I I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So like the like all of the like focus of data collection has been basically under the presumption that the person is at their desk working. And then they are doing computer oriented tasks. Right. Right. Or they're trying to distract their mind from a computer oriented task. Right. So whether yeah, they're like right. coding or writing. Yeah. 
that sounds kind of sufficiently controlled or somewhat controlled. Yeah. You yeah. don't want it to be too controlled, do you? No. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So we've done like a bunch of, like in the early winter this year, we basically brought people in uh, and then had them do a whole bunch of tasks for like a minute to five minutes with different like rest, participate in tasks, rest, capture the data and basically do like simple analysis on like 20 people or so. Um, so like relaxation kind of everyone watched the same video everyone did the same same typing exercise everyone played the same video game that type of thing um yeah. cool well i'm um, looking forward to meeting up and playing around with the gear when yeah. the lockdown ends see yeah, you at man exactly. lab sometime <laughs> John. yes yeah definitely <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for for um, coming and sharing with us your experience with this. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really excited um, to see. You know, I mean, I think we were talking about this before we started recording, just in the, the sense with with Facebook and and uh, now Kernel, both making making Nears systems. Um, I'm I'm hoping that all that extra, you know. R and D money will somehow trickle trickle around and uh, at least uh, help with um, you know things like uh, research code and and you know um, but um, yeah really great to have you thanks no, I appreciate it Morgan That's no worries. really thoughtful of you to have me here definitely definitely okay. um, so um, I you know. As long as John is is on, you can keep asking questions. Uh, um, but uh, I wanted to keep yeah. going in terms of um, there's, a, there's a biker. Um, uh, there are some other things that um, I mean. I wanted to talk about uh, BCI 101 this week and. Um, uh, could give a little bit of an overview for those who weren't able to to catch everything. Um, so um, let me just check in and see if there's anybody else who's joined us uh, that is maybe new, and um, if you'd like to introduce yourself. I know Paul had to. Oh. I also have to head out, but thanks so much, guys. This was really interesting. Yeah, See you thanks. Next week. thanks, Sergio. Yep. Um, take care. I, I'd love to hear about um, these like dot measures that tell us about physiology, you know, as opposed to just you know neural measures. But uh, you know, the super. I mean, that's that makes it a real medical, you know, medical technology. Um, anyway, if you'd Definitely. like to about it. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'll come on next week for sure. I'm happy to cool. talk about it a little bit more. Okay, <laughs> thanks so much, guys. Take Bye. care. Take care. Uh, let me just get. Um, so, I do need to um, try and have a better system than just people ask me if they need the password. <laughs> so I could. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if uh, adding it to the. Um, you know, I could just add it to the meetup. Um, the way that um, the way that BCI one hundred and one has been doing it is is having using Eventbrite, and then Eventbrite sends sends out additional information like an hour before the actual meetup, um, which is another way to do it. And yeah, I'm fully fully open to better systems. <laughs> Hey guys. All right. Hiya. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh no, it's just Josh. Oh, hey Josh. <laughs> hey, uh, you just just missed John. 
Oh, I see him there. Hey, oh. John. Yeah. yeah. Hey, John. What's up, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so um, BCI 101 for second week um, was um, definitely uh, some great some great speakers. Um, we had um, uh, you know, uh, Fabien Lot uh, speaking about his uh, BCI experience in um, Bordeaux, and um, then the. I forget the developer's name from Open Vibe, but um, some some interesting. I hadn't seen um, like vibrotactile feedback on BCI systems. That 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 was that was pretty interesting in terms of how that improved uh, improved uh, the kind of you know feedback BCI motor imagery. Um, that that I thought was. The, uh, an interesting, an interesting twist, um, and of course, uh, Robin, um, I forget his last name, from the Brain Decode team, uh, showed off some of their work on, uh, mostly on you know Moab datasets. Um, this is the the Freiburg group at um, uh, Tonio Ball uh, in Freiburg, and I think Robin's moved to. Tubing in now, but um, um, and then today was um, was a student from Charité showing a M &E tutorial on um, that was actually is is somewhat put our our current learn .neurotech edu <laughs> tutorial to shame. Um, so I don't know if everybody saw that, but. Um, uh, those two files are available. Um, let's see where he put those. Um, how, how many people on tonight actually caught BCI 101? Nobody? Which one? Today's? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, well, I, today as I've watched all the others, they're really pretty good. Okay, so you've been catching them on YouTube. Yep, yep. Gotcha. Cool. Um, yeah. So please do do check them out on YouTube. Um, uh, I thought I thought this week was was actually you know was pretty pretty informative um, in terms of. Um, especially in terms of software and yeah, just to, to leave it that. Um, the monkey brain guy, that was, that was pretty amazing. Yeah. You're uh, Mikhail Lebedev. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you know, he's, he's, you know, uh, definitely a, a very senior researcher and has been doing great work for a long time. I, I loved his talk too. In the he, he really gave you some historical context, and um, and was talking about you know some of that early Soviet work too, going back into the the fifties uh, and seventies, and yeah, um, there they, those were great, um, and I haven't actually seen the. Uh, the agenda for for next week, but I know that there is going to be talking about. Uh, I mean, it's definitely going to be a bit more in the startup focus and people's experience. Um, some some particular companies' experience getting getting projects started, but um, uh, yeah, so. Bringing up Robin, um, one of the things that I asked Robin about Brain Decode was whether he could come back next week and talk about his experience or, you know, Freiburg's, Tony, Tony Ball's lab's experience with the TUH data, which uh, somewhat poorly segues into, um, has anybody got an update on the uh, Nerika Epilepsy Challenge? And uh, is... Anybody on track for a submission? Uh, 
I'm not actually seeing who's with us. I don't. I I know a couple people who are definitely going to try for a submission. I don't know if they're joining us today, but um, um, anyway, I'm I'm definitely. Uh, so I know John Nolte's uh, had to to drop out and is on call, but. Um, uh, we still we still have the Amazon server, and with data and uh, the Jupiter Hub that uh, that John set up, and um, together with um, oh yeah, um, so uh, uh, so together with Paris, we're we're still going to push ahead with with processing the TUH data, you know. The entire data set, not just the epilepsy, and what Robin uh, has experience with, um, that I'm hoping that we could talk with him next week, um, is with the EEG pathology data set or the, you know subset. Um, but uh, he, Robin, had some some uh, uh, a nice uh, collab tutorial. Uh, available for working with Moab data, and um, uh, again, you can you can catch that on YouTube. But um, but I would love or anybody who's interested in the the TUH data set, you know, the largest publicly available clinical EEG data set, um, love to get uh, questions for Robin for for next week. And hey, Andre. Hey Morgan, could you, because uh, um, I missed it, could you describe the capabilities of the the um, uh, the server that's available for the, the? Yeah, so so right now, you know what John's John's just got um, it's a it's a C something, right? So it's just a, a CPU, a somewhat beefy CPU system, nothing special, right? Um, and now, together with Paris, we're we're going to use a, a a GPU instance to do a run of something that Paris is interested in trying, um, you know, on on the epilepsy data. Um, so, for at least for a week, we're going to have a, a GPU instance. <laughs> Uh, so if it, it, you know, that, that would be, I mean, let's coordinate with Paris in terms of, um, uh, if, if you'd like to use some of that time, like that would be awesome. Cause well, you know, I, I was thinking of actually the opposite way. If, if you oh. guys have an ability to, um, so I've, I've definitely been able to download the data set. Yeah. Um, but if you have a, an image you, I could clone, I'd be happy to, um, to, to share some hosting and to provide, um. Oh, okay. Donate some time to, to the group, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. I've been, I've basically, I wanted to contribute my time in April, but uh, uh, it's no, other, no. other things have come up. So I think uh, that's what I'm offering, yeah. No, no, that's 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 terrific. So, um, well, what I wanna say is that, that that working group was like going to, to, you know, be continuing past May 17th or, I forget when the deadline is. But um, but we're gonna be we're gonna be working on this you know hopefully uh, uh, all summer and um, uh, you know again there's there's a lot more data than just the epilepsy and there's um, there's you know what I would say is like more broadly applicable uh, um, you know clinical results that that can be drawn from that as well. So um, yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, can we, basically, can I can we mirror that and and kind of crowdsource that infrastructure? Like like you know again like we we certainly can, and we've got people who could help with doing that part that that might not feel you know so comfortable in terms of helping with the you know the deep learning. So yeah, that would be that would be awesome. I mean, what. Um, all that John and, and others would need to know is, you know, what are what are the, some of the ways in which they could, um, you know, they could share that. 
And, you know, so just tell, tell us in the Slack, like what you think uh, would be the easiest way. No. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's that's um, great. So I think, yeah, definitely follow up online or <laughs> offline rather. <laughs> And yeah, what, I mean, what we're definitely going to try and do, you know, so we're going to get a week of GPU time uh, um, with Paris to to also be doing something. And and like, I'm kind of, you know, anyway, they're, they're still really interested in helping with this as like a, you know, multi-site effort um, that like is bigger than this challenge, right? And um and what I'm really hoping is that we can turn that into extra hardware resources, right? So that if they can see that there's actually some momentum in working with this data and they see like how valuable that is in terms of, you know, greater clinical applications than just epilepsy. I mean, epilepsy is great. Um, but again, this, this data, you know, if we could pull out things like, you know, sleep brain age and things like that, like, those would be much more widely applicable. And um, anyway, like definitely trying to figure out ways that we can extend our, our hardware <laughs> resources, um, you know, and um, yeah, I'd love, love anybody's input on that, you know, cause I've got, I've got a good GPU system here at the house, but I don't really know how to, to best make that like, generally available and not become like everybody's got to talk to me to you know get a password kind of thing like i, I that would be awesome a anybody have any any thoughts on that um so, so i'm just replying um Um, somebody's just asking. Um, so yeah, yeah, please. yeah. Steve, it's him. Hey, Steve. <laughs> how you doing? Good, good. So great. <laughs> yeah, great to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> oh, hi, yeah. Steve. Hello. <laughs> well, welcome. Hey, everyone, this is Steve Mann, the father of wearable computing. Nice. <laughs> How are you doing? I good. Good. Where, where are you joining us from? Uh, so I'm, I'm in Toronto right now, which is actually where we founded, uh, my students and I and a bunch of people got together and founded a company called Interaxon that makes a product called the Muse, Muse 2, and Muse S Sleep Band. And yeah. this, is the, this is the room in which the company right here in this building. Nice. So, uh, yeah, I'm in... in in Toronto, I miss uh, I miss the city though. I uh, when I'm there, I usually swim every day, twice a day sometimes at uh, Aquatic Park, just up past Pier 57. Um, <laughs> so it's it's quite nice, uh, uh, and I, it's great to see what you guys are all what you're all doing with the neurotech stuff. I've been working on wearables since early childhood and making things and building uh, brain computer interfaces and mind mesh and all kinds of things. I had mind mesh from years and years ago and then we founded this company, Graxon, and now John and I have found another company called Blueberry X, Blueberry uh, eyeglasses, you know those eyeglasses. Sure, sure. Are there wires coming out of your glasses? Yeah. yeah so that's that's the, um, uh, so there's a, a photo detector and an emitter, pairs, groups of photo detectors and emitters that measure the oxygen level into the brain this is just a rough prototype of a comfortable eyeglass that you can wear while sleeping. It monitors the brain, brain activity. And uh, so I'm inter interested in capturing lucid dreaming and remembering dreams and sure. being more productive and getting better sleep and all that sort of thing. Sure. And, and were, were you coming at this as an engineer or as, as a researcher, scientist? 
I don't know. Uh, people have sort of described me strangely enough as, uh, I don't know, I don't know what I am, but um, <laughs> I mean, our, our first CEO said, you know, Steve Mann's like a modern day, you know, Margaret Vinci, sort of artist, scientist, inventor, mathematician, musician. I can't quite figure out what I am, but I'm just interested in building things. There's a famous quote, specialization is for insects, I guess I kind of like that. So I don't know if I would say, um, I, I certainly do engineering and I teach electrical engineering and Fourier analysis and uh, digital signal processing yeah. and mathematics and everything. But I'm, I'm equally interested in sort of the human condition and technologies that become part of us, wearables and other technologies that become part of us and the boundary between us, ourselves, and that which surrounds us. So if you think of the environment as that which surrounds us and the environment as us ourselves, I'm interested in the environment, environment boundary, the interplay between the environment and the environment. And, and do you do any work with uh, with AR as well? I mean, on those yeah. glasses, can you, yeah. Yeah, we do, we build AR. Uh, uh, um, I guess Charles Wyckoff and I back in 1991 coined the term XR eyeglass like X reality as a uh, sort of extended reality. He invented XR film. And when I joined forces with him, we took that concept of XR film into, into computational framing of XR. And so out of that came the invention of HDR, high dynamic range imaging and X reality and various things like that. And then we came up with the XY reality and all reality sort of if you just do a search on all reality, you'll find all the realities like augmented reality, mediated reality, X reality, Y reality, Z reality, the whole, the whole mess. And in in all the, the work that you've done, have you ever tried to go, you know, uh, whole brain, whole heads? Uh, um, have you ever been interested in the, you know, the multi-channel, super high dense arrays? Yeah, in my childhood, I built a, a, a skull cap permanently attached to my skull with 64 oh. uh, electrodes in it. And uh, over the years, that's been uh, uh, just part of me in some ways. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but the, I was just going to, the origin of, of XR is different from the origin of X reality. <laughs> so wow. I had that thing. Over the years, I've had on and off built various versions of that that are permanently attached. And then eventually we came up with a muse that was kind of the opposite because I started with these things that were permanently fixed. Or it's even, you know, on my passport photo because it's part of me. It, it, <laughs> take me as I am, you know, it's, it's just, that's just me, you know, like it or not. And there, then, was, uh, there, there was this, uh, 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 I, I don't know if Malyank is, is with us this evening, but uh, uh, he's a high school student presented and he used um, he used uh, uh, pennies as his electrodes. And oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, here. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's the years, years and years ago, I've been playing around with this since I was about 12 years old. So. Uh, I'm I'm losing you a little bit. I don't know if it's my connection. Sorry. Hi, right, Steve. Can you still hear me? We, we, I think we temporarily lost him. Oh, okay. Uh, so you guys can hear me, yeah? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Okay, okay. Um, I, I can't say that Comcast has fully fixed my internet. <laughs> so I, but uh, I hope we can get his audio back. Um, it looks like he, it looks like he dropped out of the room temporarily. I, I guess he might reconnect. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, well, um, that's awesome. Um, and yeah, thanks, thanks, John, for connecting us. I don't. Um, John was him. Like that was. I think that was the same. Oh, computer. 
Okay, okay. It, it looks so much brighter there. <laughs> They're not social distancing, is basically. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> um, no, Steve takes people in like children. They're part of the <laughs> family. Okay, so it's it's. It, I mean, I'm I'm gonna have to read up. Uh, uh, but uh, I love that that first that sixty four channel system and. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, hi again. Hi, we just vanished somehow. I, we 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 thought I lost you. <laughs> yeah. Good, good. good. <laughs> so um, yeah, so you've looked like you got some interesting equipment behind you too. Um, you're where where are you now? So I'm in the room where Interaxon was founded. This is sort of my front. It's my lab. Gotcha. But it's also my principal residence while I'm in Toronto. It's called Man Lab Canada officially. If you look on Google Maps. Okay. And that uh, well, this is just sort of some things from years gone by. Like the one on the left is a cathode ray oscillograph my dad got for me when I was 12 years old, and the time base on it was broken, and it would only the dot would only move up and down. <laughs> and so I put it on, a, on wheels, on the skateboard wheels, and sliding across my desk back and forth. And I had it hooked to a police radar, and I could see that tracing out the same waveform all the time while pushes. So I kind of discovered this notion of overlays of waveforms on top of reality, exactly in alignment with reality. So then, and I was doing that with brain waves and different kinds of waves. I got a grass, mm -hmm. I still got my old grass SB9. Yeah, yeah. Waves there. I used to swim out my neuron action potentials. To see the electricity flowing through my own new nerve. Yeah, so uh, a grass, a grass was my first system too. Excellent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. From from invertebrates, recording from invertebrates. <laughs> oh yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. worms, right? Uh, in in our case, we were actually looking at crabs. Oh. So we were we were, doing, we're looking at sleep like states in invertebrates. <laughs> oh, that's super fun. <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah. When I was growing up, I did worms, swimming out worms, and then I was swimming out my own ulnar, the electricity flow along my own ulnar combined neuron action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was one of those grass systems that you had to get these big buckets of paper, you know, and and it would you'd feed in this paper to. Oh, you use punch paper tape to drive it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It cool. was. You know, it was the it was the only thing that the college should let me use for this crazy project. Yeah, well, that's great because it was probably older equipment they're getting rid of, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, it was. Uh, yeah. So I haven't seen a grass. I mean, I, I take it they're still around, but uh, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, uh, so uh, sorry, I, I was well. You showed me the uh, your your high density system, which that was cool. Um, you, you, what did you say about uh, about what you're projecting on the glasses? So one of the other things that we're doing is different kinds of realities. So I wrote a paper called All Reality. If you search All Reality, mm -hmm. uh, it'll probably find it. So I did things like VR float tanks and uh, central okay. heat tanks. EEG in a float tank, and you know. so, so somebody has figured that out. La Paix, which is a, a you know a biohacking space in Paris, has uh, a sensory deprivation tank, and they were always they were always asking for somebody to make equipment that they could use in there. <laughs> oh, okay. So what I did is just made my own equipment for use in the tank. I built my own tank as well, and uh, then I made an underwater pipe organ to go in the tank, and as you can see over there. On the back wall there, I've got, I've got some of these underwater musical instruments. Can you take us on a tour? Sure, sure. There's some underwater pipe organs right here. Uh, I don't know if you can see them there or not, but uh, underwater musical instruments. And then uh, where else is there? There's, this is my Dynasty 350 TIG welder. So I can weld up to one inch thick steel plates and make underwater sculptures and things like that. And then this is just my lab, my workbenches. I've got here this this new oscilla. It's funny, I've got this new oscilloscope. Um, it's about, you know, it's a nice $20,000 machine, but nobody ever uses it because everybody seems to, I think the favorite scope in my lab 
is probably this one right here, this this eight key scope. It's got differential inputs. Very, very sensitive, so you can actually hook yourself right up to it and see it. But I noticed with all these modern oscilloscopes that they only update very infrequently, whereas you can't see real phenomena moving like on an XY plot. And then what else do we have in here is the, this is the sunroom, but it's a little dark in here now, but this is where <laughs> this is where we did a lot of the interaxon stuff. And then back there, further back, I've got the sensory deprivation room, which mm -hmm. is a dark room with float tank. And uh, and then downstairs, I've got another dark room, which is an anechoic dark room, sleep lab, and for lucid dreaming and stuff like that. Gotcha. And, and when when you started Interaxon, what, was that the the main focus? Was was it? Uh, I mean, did it have a, a particular focus? Well, it started out just as a fun, silly thing. I mean, we had a whole bunch of people together all over the net, and we were in float tanks, and we were uh, generating music from from uh, our brains, you know. And the idea was to meditate in the float tank, and generate music. So we put all these these tanks all over the world and have them connect together wirelessly. And we uh, did all kinds of fun things. So it was mostly uh, just fun, goofy things. I did like 20 years ago, uh, I did, I met the team. We met up our first uh, uh, performance event at the gallery. This is kind of like a fun gallery where we do crazy things. The first event we did uh, 20 years ago was a pandemic preparedness event. No way where we had everybody, uh, we stripped and washed all the attendees, and then we gave them all hazmat suits, and we had N95 masks, and we had a social distancing protocol worked out where people had to wear masks and keep their distance and uh, and, and be uh, decontaminated on the way in, um, in, in sort of a simulation of the suspension of civil liberties that occurs in Michel Foucault's book, he wrote that authority loves a plague, and we sort of transcribed it to government loves pandemics. Um, just kind of a, a silly fun thing. But, you know, it was interesting because a lot of those designs that we did then became actually uh, industry standards that are used. So we did a lot of crazy things and brain bath was another one where we had musical brain baths where people were in float tanks gendering music and stuff like that. And so we did all these concerts where people were connected as cyborg collectives. And then a lot of these things that we started as a joke ended up becoming a business. Yeah, I see. I see. And and is there uh, a, like a gallery or is, what, what space was this in? Uh, well, this, this is my principal residence. So it's it's just a building. It's kind of an industrial uh, uh, commercial mixed building. Okay. And it, it sort of, we live here and it made it into a little fun gallery and a workshop. And I've got about a dozen 3D printers here and a lathe and two milling machines. And That's my wife. My wife is okay as long as the swarf stays downstairs and uh, <laughs> I don't put the milling machine in the living room upstairs. Sure, sure, sure. Well, that, I mean, it, it sounds it sounds very much like um, like the Exploratorium here. Uh, yeah, I've been to the Exploratorium. I had my underwater pipe work in there. They loved it. It was fun. I I I, I could imagine. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of overlap. Um, Wow, that's that's great. When did when did you start Interaxon? I mean, uh, forgive me well, for not knowing the history here. I guess it's it's really hard to pin it down exactly, but I guess it was the deconference came before. So the oh. first event that we had that got this arts collective going was the deconference, uh, deconference two thousand, where we stripped and washed all the attendees, and then we had deconference two thousand one, deconference two thousand and two. These were inverse conferences, but deconference also starts with the word decon, so it sort of worked out. And then, uh, and then around that time, we started having these other events. We had the deconcert, uh, which is an inverse concert, but it also has the word. It also starts with the word decon, and uh, so it was a decontamination concert where everybody had to be stripped and washed and decontaminated before they were performing in the generating music in the brain baths floating in these float tanks. Uh, mm -hmm. with social distancing to keep people isolated so that disease would not spread. And then the hydrolophone is the self-cleaning keyboard for germaphobes who want to play a musical instrument but don't want to touch a shared keyboard. So the hydrolophone is a musical instrument that plays music with water flowing. So it's a keyboard, but all the keys are made out of water. 
so it's a soft cleaning instrument as far as generate social distancing. So that was all around maybe year 2000, 2001, 2002. So we kind of grew out of that and did all these crazy events and it sort of morphed gradually into uh, something. And then the Vancouver Olympics picked us as a headline act for this kind of um, thing there. And that got us a bunch of money without loss and we formed a company. And eventually uh, we had a great, super creative CEO which, and then we got a official C, you know, more vertical, classical CEO, and I don't know, sort of grew over the years um, uh, into a whole bunch of different things, actually a whole bunch of different companies really that sort of came, some of them more successful than others. Sure, sure, sure. Well, you, you'll be you'll be happy to know that my, or certainly the, the first experience that uh, I had with Neurotech X was, uh, I mean, other than, than demo days was the, um, was an exploratorium concert like uh, um, it was what what Marion developed Cloudbrain for, which was you know collecting collecting EG from a bunch of people uh, all watching a show at the oh, cool. at, at at the exploratorium. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. Cloudbrain. So it was they're watching the show and then they were collecting the brains. Yeah. So I guess what we did that was a bit different maybe is that, that they were the show, like the, the, yeah, the yeah. it was kind of closed loop. So this is what we call humanistic intelligence. Marvin Minsky, the father of AI, he invented a uh, machine learning field. Uh, him and I together with Ray Kurzweil, chief, who's now the chief engineer of Google, the three of us did this thing called humanistic intelligence, which is intelligence that arises by having a human being the feedback to the computational process. And the idea is that the machine senses you and you sense the machine. And so there's a kind of closed loop. So it's like you're in this neural feedback loop as you interact. And that's kind of a way of, of, of where, you know, wearables or interaction using closed loop. If you search for humanistic intelligence, okay. HI or whatever else it's called, human machine learning or... I just pasted a link in. Oh, cool. And, and I mean, so you've you've definitely uh, definitely done some work on sonification of of EEG. Absolutely, and, yeah. We've done tons and tons of concerts, ranging from direct collaborative EEG across the web with people all over the world participating remotely and sharing each other's brainwaves as a cyborg collective, uh, and then on through to, to generative or re and regenerative music and. Uh, in fact, if you look at the muse, it's interesting. People look at the muse and they look, if you look down and dig around and hack it a little bit, you'll notice that there's OSC messages flying around. And people wonder why are you using OSC? And the answer is because we started with MIDI. The first mute, the first brainwave stuff we built was all MIDI controllers and then they evolved to OSC controllers. So even to this day, all the muse products do everything with OSC. So it's clearly designed by, by music fanatics. Sure, sure, sure. Now, it, it, it's come up a couple times, you know, people have talked about, you know, the, the benefits of using OSC over LSL. And, you know, obviously, one of the one of the things, the easiest thing to think about is, of course, just feeding that into other sonification systems. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, uh, sonification is one thing and, and also direct. Uh, I'm not totally in love with MIDI. I mean, we sort of the the gang that seemed to be what people are using but i'm more into like undigital being on digital sort of continuous uh, so i did something i came up with something we, we call fluidity which is like you take 15 midi you take whatever song you're going to play and hope it only has 15 notes in it and then you, we 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 turned on one channel's percussion has to be but the other 15 is a 16 the other 15 can be notes so what i do is i turn one note on each channel and leave it on all the time and then just modulate its parameters continuously and i call that fluidity which is sort of a fluidly continuous uh, uh undigital i call that being undigital uh so the notes never start or end they just sort of evolve over time huh did you ever did you ever play with mind machines or or do eeg driving where you you drove changes to light and sound effects in your led glasses and headphones with um, your EEG signals? Well, one thing we did is we built a wheelchair for quadriplegics using the ITAP. So that uh, that was successful. Chris Amini and I, he's, he, was, uh, one, um, he was my uh, one of my students. And uh, 
he's a really smart guy. He he's been building since young. You know, he had a lathe in his bedroom when he was six years old. Grew up with a machine shop in his bedroom all his life, making things kind of like me in some ways. And we hit it off right away. I find when I meet people like that, something clicks. You know, it's, it's really wonderful when you meet somebody who sees the world the way that you see the world. And so we connected. And so he was into making things and we built this wheelchair that's driving um, by the, so that a quadriplegic can drive the wheelchair. Just you know, some degree, it's could argue whether it worked great or needs more work, it obviously needs more research. But we built this thing and it kind of placed fairly well and we got invited to bring it down to the IEEE uh, presentation. And so that sort of thing and driving games as well, driving simulators. And I've got a Ford Focus Electric that we're hacking into a self-driving car and we want to make that drivable by quadriplegic. We want to make that brain wave compatible if we can. And Steve, what about like uh, changing your own brain state, like in a feedback loop? Yeah, that's one thing that I'm really interested in. I'm interested in how can I use this to improve mental health and well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing is a lot of people have difficulty coping with uh, the world around them. And so I'm interested in anything to help people with autism or trouble um, relating or connecting sensory, uh, sensory processing issues combined with mediated reality and brain waves, looking at the world through reality mediators. So X reality and mediated reality, X Y reality, um, with uh, brain waves driving it as a way of helping people cope with information overload and, and, and information processing difficulties. So hopefully you can hear me. It's a bit loud in this space. I had a question um, when you, you said you did, you worked on projects involving synchronizing um, across many, many users. And I was wondering what techniques would you use on a low level to synchronize multiple brain brainwaves and, and brain you know, data collecting devices? Uh, well, what we what I, what I had is um, very simple hardware back then. That was before the Muse when we started. Uh, we just built very, very simple hardware. So I use simple things like uh, uh, my favorite technology um, is a PAR124A lock and amplifier made in 1961. It was the best amplifier that was ever made in human history. Uh, nobody's ever built a better amplifier. When I was at MIT, that's what we used. When I was at Stanford, that's what we used and still use. They're still running at Stanford. PA124A is still at MIT. Same thing. So I've been, uh, I built and collected and restored a number of those amplifiers. And also, I designed my own lock and amplifier, uh, which we manufactured in Shenzhen uh, area. And uh, picking up multi multiple components. So we do chirplet based signal processing, the chirplet transform, which is a generalization of the wavelet transform. So metaplectomorphisms is a time frequency plane. So you can have, instead of just having time and frequency, you know, if you look at nature, uh, human made sounds like, you know, you know, it's all just tones, but in nature, the song of the birds is chirps. So the brain waves evolve naturally, they change from alpha to beta continuously, they don't jump, you know, suddenly from one to the other, so they match the phenomenon, so the triplet transform. And so, and there's a fellow, uh, Richard is his name, uh, he did a thesis on, on uh, triplet based visual evoked potentials, really phenomenal work. And so if you take that work and, and connect those devices, and we use UDP uh, packets, simple packets, we built uh, our own ISA cards to plug into PC, so Back then it was ISA and we made our own cards and we built our own hardware and we uh, wrote our own device drivers to extend the operating system to use the hardware. We pushed everything out over UDP, very simple, uh, and web very simple using internet in a very simplistic way, using very low technology, simple locking amplifiers based on chirps as well, modifying the locking amplifier to use chirp as reference signal, things like that. Mm -hmm. everything uh, very fundamental science, fundamental physics. Given. So this this was all like very local in terms of synchronization. Uh, local in what sense? Like, I mean, like not. I mean, you had PCs all in the same room. Uh, so we had forty eight people in 
in this room back here, <laughs> uh, the glass ceiling room. So we had in this room, I guess it's a little dark in there, but we had 48 people in that room. Um, and you can see online, there's some nice pictures of it. With it. It's a glass ceiling room, the sun shines right in there. And it was later at night, so we actually put lights outside the building, shining them to yeah. make it simulate natural light. And then we had some people in New York. We had some Parkinson's patients in New York City also connected in. And they were participating fully. So we had people who were unable to move, you know, physically challenged people being able to be full participants in the concert. And then we had down the street in Toronto, also on College Street, we had a tub set up there uh, with some participants in it. We rented a hot tub and turned into a float. And we had some participants in that one. And then we had other tubs uh, in various other places. Uh, I've got a, a lab. Uh, uh, we have a lab in Shenzhen. We have a lab in uh, Shaman. And we, so we have other float tanks that we can have people remotely participate in. There's some lag uh, across the internet, like to China, there's quite a bit of lag. Yeah. Um, uh, but the thing is, at least within the groups, there's local immediacy uh, because it, it was all very low level protocols. So there's almost no delay locally. It's not like now when you have bloatware, it was just very, very simple Linux running on 46 PC with an ISA card bare buttons. So it's quick, almost no latency. It was in the same 48 people in the room. And then there's another group of people in another place with some latency between the groups. So what I, what I would say is, I mean, it's exciting to hear you talk about using UDP because that's very, very common um, and available kind of everywhere. Um, what I think is pretty exciting is there's a, a family of, of microcontrollers coming up that has embedded um, Ethernet controllers where the entire Ethernet stack is memory mapped. And event, essentially your sampling device just does whatever it needs to do, drops it into a register, and out that packet goes without requiring any CPU cycles or processing at all. And then you're just depending upon the latency of the network, uh, which if you're doing it locally can be really good. And then if you're doing it over the world, then yeah, you have those issues. What uh, 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 what pro um, what processors that you're using that get memory map? Uh, so there's a number of, of uh, maybe we can talk offline, but um, most commonly there's a, a Hilscher product that, that does that. Um, yeah, actually, is there mainly for industrial controllers? It's mainly for industrial controllers. They embed all the industrial I.O. on it for memory mapping and then. Excellent. Uh, yeah. So this whole the, it's 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 really exciting because in my I'm more in industrial space and, and really that's where we're trying to, to move our, our, our products over because they use there the, the status quo is uh, ancient analog and RS45 based interfaces to do industrial synchronization of devices and tools and sampling sensors across the factory. Um, and there the challenge is, you know, there's all these highfalutin protocols and, and attempts yeah. to synchronize. All this bloatware. You need is UDP and you just need a good network engineer to set up the network intelligently so you, you set up all your priorities and your, your channel flows right into your brains, into your brain centers. And, and so, I mean, this, I think there's a very large amount of overlap and a coincidence between the movement in one space, which is extremely, has a lot of money behind it, which is industrial tech. Uh, the car manufacturers are using real-time Ethernet products. Uh, all the semiconductor manufacturers are switching to that. And then in, in kind of more neurotech and hobby and wearable space can really use that same technology and, and, and doesn't have to pay for designing their own ASIC or anything like, like that, which is really what the next step would be after that. Yeah, that's great. What, what was your name again? Uh, I'm Andre. I've been friends with, with Morgan for a while. I'm oh. a physicist by trade in, in neurotech. Oh, that's uh, Traveler, yeah. Andre. Yeah, uh, I work as an engineer, an uh, electrical engineer at a semiconductor company. Andre. Yeah, if you can if you can connect with me, that would be fantastic. I'd love to connect with you more. Maybe we can jam and build some things together. Like I'd love to go deep with some people who are really strong in math and physics. Yeah, be, I mean, it sounds like you um, a lot of the, the things that you were doing 20, 30 years ago, uh, it, they resonate with me because I'm solving those same problems right now in a totally different space. So it's, it's really exciting to, to kind of, uh, well, one, know that it's been done and, and two, that, um, you know, at least I can talk to you and figure out what you did. Yeah, that would be fantastic if we could connect, Andre. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, I don't know what's the best way uh, 
How do you well, guys? I certainly, I know, I know Morgan fairly well, and um, certainly maybe Morgan can I'll, email me some of that. I'll definitely, I'll get you in touch. Yeah, and uh, um, you know, Andre's been looking at uh, some of the some of the issues that we've been looking at, or some of the the challenges that we've been trying to trying to overcome in terms of this kind of EEG yeah. synchronization uh, across WAN, you know, and like how to how to deal with the timing issues in some sort of appropriate way. Um, uh, but yeah. To, to get yeah, that's, that's super fantastic. And anyone else who's into really going deep with math and physics and fundamentals, um, I want to reinvent the whole the whole world of BCI and um, really trying to rethink it now and come up with the next big thing in BCI. So I'd love to to go deep and get a super core group of, of, of people who are who are really prepared to to really push to the next frontier. And uh, John and I here uh, are, are sort of trying to come up with the next big thing. And we're also looking for new people to join us. Uh, it'd be super fantastic if we could. What we did with Interaxon was literally just got the smartest people in the world together and, and uh, had super fun, natural born makers, a whole bunch of people all in the same space. Sure. And uh, kind of would be fun to do that again. Yeah, well, so, and I mean, are you, well, I mean, this is this is awesome. Um, so, you know, I, I'd love to you know hear more. I mean, what, are you thinking about sensors? Are you thinking about um, you know new modalities? Are you you know um, what we're well, gonna? Thing, yeah. The thing that I uh, that fascinated me, one of my favorite childhood hobbies, I guess, was what I call meta sensing, which is the sensing of sensors, mm -hmm. sensing sensors, and sensing the capacity to sense. And so that was that was one of the, the kind of driving forces was um, you know trying to trying to sense so um, so that's what uh, the uh, telescope moving was to see if you look if you search swim sequential wave and printing machine uh, that's kind of an example of meta sensing the sensing of sensors or uh, if you search for meta vision which is the name of the company that we founded. And, and not so, one of the one of the less successful companies we found, although we raised seventy five million dollars, but then kind of went went south there a little bit. But um, you win some and you lose some. I mean, Interacts on still in business, but MetaVision Tank, and MetaVision was based on some a discovery I made when I was about twelve years old. That if you take a television set and move it in front of a surveillance camera, it'll feed back and reveal where the surveillance camera is uh, and the augmented reality overlay. And so then I realized I could do it with a light bulb and a locking amplifier, and I made all these metavision systems. And then I realized you could do it with SSVEP and swim out the human vision. So we swim out everything, police radar, you can see police radar waves, the police are watching you, and now you can watch them. So we call that surveillance, which is le contraire de surveillance. You know, surveillance, French word surveillance is the reverse, and then metavalence is the valence of valence and metavision. So if you search that up, that's kind of what we're interested in. Well, there's some good examples of swims there. It's a bunch of thinking machines. And so that was kind of my, my childhood hobby was photographing the photographing, sensing the sensors and sensing. There's a, that's a good example of the street light there. So there's a smart city street light and there's a photograph that I took of the smart city street light that shows you what the street light's capacity to see is. So that's the kind of thing that, that I was sort of originally fascinated about and kind of we're looking at that now as a new way of doing an eye test for example. Hey, this one shows your heart rate. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of funny. I don't know if that's actually useful for anything or not, but, but yeah, it was just <laughs> simple fun. This is well, that'd be cool to do that with the EEG too. Yeah, yeah, we did a lot of that stuff with EEG. Like one of the things we're doing with SSVEP to be able to see in the mind's eye, like we did, uh, uh, Kyle Matthewson and I and a bunch of others got together and did some fun things with the uh, ionograph. Ionograph from the Hebrew word ayin, which means eye. And uh, this is like the the seeing inside the eye, like reading the mind more or less to be able to see what the eye sees. So we have pictures of what people can see reading up through their eye. And also, well, there's one, there's an example of someone's face. So on the left is the input and on the right is what we read from the brain. 
Oh, that's cool. And then those are ionographs. So that's that's kind of the eye as a camera sort of mindset. <laughs> this sort of interesting thing. There's the no. We did like a no cameras loud sign, and then we did. It's always so funny has these no cameras allowed sign. And all, combined with all the surveillance, it's like total hypocrisy. So you can't say, oh, you want to read out mind's eye and get pictures of all these no cameras allowed signs. Yeah. It, it's really cool seeing all this stuff um, uh, from before you um uh, did stuff like the meta glasses and uh, um all the stuff that led up to that i mean i know meta kind of fell through but the work you've done over the years and right now is so influential to so many in the field like it's sad that he couldn't be here today, but one of the people who you've worked with a couple of times is actually a old part of this group, um, Alex Peak. Um, oh, uh, yes, that's great. Say hello to Alex Peak for me. I yeah. definitely will. I, Me and him work a lot on VR and AR stuff. Like, I've worked with him about trying to do a number of different um, games with him that incorporate VR, EG, different stuff like that. And uh, like all the research you did has helped us quite a number of times when we've been trying to see about making games that actually have mapping to certain parts of the brain, figure out how to also make games that have menus that logically represent the brain. So, you know, it would be fantastic. Why don't you, me, uh, Andre, who I talked to earlier, and Alex Peake jump on a Zoom call and see if we can hammer out the future of, of game-based. Like I'm interested in game collectors, like what can we do in terms of making neural games that are that help improve people's mental health and well-being? Yeah, that, that would be really cool. I just messaged Alex to see if he could join in here tonight, but he, he's been pretty busy. We've been working a bit on trying to archive reality in a sense where we're trying to get 3d scans of historical places and then put them in vr and then at some point try to see if there's going to be any machine learning algorithms that could scrub the internet for photos of objects and then recreate those objects throughout any time so if you in the future go outside with a augmented headset, the time you are outside has no meaning because you could go out any day in history that's been surveilled enough um, by the community. Just yeah, think yeah. yeah. Yeah, looking back at, at things, so that, that's, that's always been something fun is looking at historical retrospectives or what the future could hold if we could get to know Yeah. And history often affects the brain. I mean, like, picture being able to see a place you grew up from dies you grew up with, like, from that perspective. Um, and, like, I think there'd be a lot of meaning if we can allow people to see with eyes that are not restricted only seeing what is currently right in front of them but what's been in front of them and what can be in front of them and then moving beyond that into 
different brain computer interface, sensory interfaces, they expand everything. Yeah, it's I'll definitely make sure to let Alex know we all talked and I want to try to get him to start coming back to these meetings. It's yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, and if there's anyone else you know, um, certainly in California, there's a lot of really cool, fun people. And um, well, and I, I just sent uh, I just sent John Andre's email. Oh, that's excellent. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, please, um, everybody, please keep in touch. And yeah, let's, let's stay in touch and we'll keep our social distancing and have these conference calls for the time being until we can, uh, until I can get back down to the city and then we can all go for a swim in, in Aquatic Park. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I'll bring my underwater pipe organ and we can play a little bit of uh, fun uh, meditation in the, in the brainwaves. But uh, but at least for the time being, we'll do our social distancing and, uh, and, yes. and stay yeah. online. <laughs> totally, totally. I want to ask a general question. Is it okay? Sure, Link. Just about just about generally speaking, like uh, sort of like a cutting edge neuroscience. Like, what are the best locations in the world? Um, you know, when we talk about uh, creating like games, like neuro games. I mean, that's pretty. It's pretty, it, they get it's to a point where like at some point you need to be surrounded by a network of people that have that mental model and understand uh, what you're talking about. So I'm just curious to hear people's thoughts about like, in terms of like location wise, like, you know, wh where do we go? Uh, what are the places? Sure. Certainly, uh, one thing we can say is Toronto has really become this epicenter of neuroscience, like completely like uh, when, when I was in California, we did a lot of that stuff, but I must say, most things are epicentered in California, like or in Shenzhen or Xiamen or someplace like that. Mm -hmm. But DCI has like got a really strong root in Toronto because our company interacts and we stayed here. Most of the other companies I found have moved to New York and California, but uh, interacts on stayed right here in Toronto. It's really become this super hotbed of neuroscience and neurotech. So if you want to come right to the where a lot is happening, definitely want to come to Toronto. <clears throat> hey, uh, hey, Steve. I, 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 I'm, I've been working on combining uh, EEG with uh, web VR in the past, and right now I'm looking to combine uh, FNIRS with web XR. And Excellent. yeah, so I mean, I, I thought I would mention it as a as a project. I, I definitely appreciate. I do a weekly hack night uh, for web XR and. Um, um, right now, I'm, I'm studying FNIRS to see what I can do in terms of just creating a biofeedback application in AR and also in VR. But I want to uh, eventually also incorporate um, uh, optical imaging. I want to like reconstruct images and put them into AR and induce and do things like um, maybe uh, incorporate. Um, I don't know. I've lost ideas, but I thought I would mention the idea because I definitely like to get more people involved um, in, uh, in doing things like combining brain computer interfaces with mm -hmm. AR and VR and also combining multiple um, sensor modalities together with deep learning to, to see what we can do to, um, to find correlations between uh, the, the user, the environment, and uh, things that we can create in between in uh, the XR space. That would be super cool. Yeah, that's sort of like my, my, life's, my life's goal and purpose as I've, def I've defined it, is to Maybe, make brain yeah. interfaces. It'd be fun to write some kind of manifesto about XR, uh, F FNIRS and EEG, the nexus of those three things. Like that would be really, really awesome. Maybe we should get a, get a few people together and just write a little uh, uh, co-author, a little piece, you know, just about this, where this is, where it's been, where it's going, and where we think it should go. Kind of architect a roadmap for the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you, do you feel somewhat vindicated to see all these uh, all these billionaires and uh, super large companies coming into uh, coming into your space? <laughs> 
Yeah, it's it certainly uh, it certainly makes sense, and almost makes sense for us to take a leadership role. I'd love to grab a few people, like yourself included, and write something uh, about what where technology's been and where it's going, mm. and sort of like take an active role in leading the industry to where we think it should go. Because people are following us, but I think they're doing it the wrong way. Mm. I think what happens a lot of times people see something that we've done and say, "Wow, that's really really cool. We can make some money off that." So they kind of get it wrong and the company tanks uh but it and and then it it leaves a sour taste right because you, oh we tried that and it didn't work well of course it didn't work because it didn't do the right and so maybe we can spare a lot of people a lot of agony and sort of write where we think uh this should go like i would be happy to write a sort of roadmap together with some of you and maybe co-author something together that says okay where do we think xr and ethniers and EEG should go together, you know, or this is a nice combination of things. Where do we want to take it, for example? Well, I, I'm certainly very interested in the the, um, the medical applications, and in particular, the psychiatric applications. And I, I think it's, it's a very untapped, um, uh, it's very, un these are untapped modalities and certainly, it's it's a, an area of medicine that is in most need, um, in my opinion. But um, yeah, we will. We'd love to. I'd love to follow up. And um, yeah, let's do, let's write something about wearables and mental health. You know, yeah. and where we think that industry ought to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe some people will pay attention if enough of us, uh, you know, have this opinion. <laughs> Sorry, I should introduce the two of you. Um, Steve, this is Morgan Ho, who's the, he runs the Neurotech San Francisco and has been organizing this kind of new global version of Neurotech Earth. Oh, that's, cool. that's cool. So Morgan, this, this is like a global, uh, uh, something global. Like your, the Neurotech X, I think that comes out of Montreal, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it was um, Yannick and Sydney that started it in Montreal. Yes. And, um, and you know, uh, San Francisco was just one of the one of the early chapters, and um, uh, that I I got to see I got to see kind of sort of its birth. Um, but uh, um, you know, Marion and and Will's garage was uh, was where we used to meet. Uh, here, well, it was over in Castro. I, I'm in the Haight Ashbury right now, but uh, um, uh, yeah, it, it uh, because of lockdown and um, you know, it, it really is a pretty global group, you know, and um, so we kind of consolidated our meetups, um, and at least for those who are in compatible time zones. <laughs> Do you, do you see yourself uh, at, as a as a this global thing that you're trying to launch or whatever it is? Do you see that as a chapter of Neurotech X, or do you see that as something new? Well, I mean, certainly, you know, I think everybody's coming to Neurotech X as with maybe you know a different background and and different goals. Um, but uh, it just happens that my particular goals are. Are focused on development of psychiatric applications of neuroimaging. So oh, excellent. why don't we start? Yeah, it is to start something new. Like it's nice to be a chapter of Neurotech X, and I host Neurotech X here, like Neurotech X Toronto. Yes, yeah. it's here in my house, which is my lab, which is a big you know gallery, museum space, or whatever. Yeah. But um, uh, it would be fun also to maybe start something new, uh, wearables and mental health. Let's say. Um, uh, that would that would not that would be a new thing itself would have chapters. So we could start something, a new thing, and then let it spin off various chapters. It could be wearables, mental health, X reality, uh, F years, EEG, you know, these kinds of things, not just neurotech. Because the problem in my mind with neurotech is it's a, it's at the heart of what I love and near and dear to me. But when I talk about that to the average layperson, uh, when I say wearables and mental health, it really resonates much, much more strongly than than just neurotech alone. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, this, this 
somewhat segues into you know some of the things we were going to talk about tonight. Um, you know, with I mean, certainly John and I, John Griffiths and I, share share some goals. Uh, I think in terms of of how we would like to use um, you know some of these neural measures uh, for mental health applications, and and you know we were kind of you know. I don't want to say. I mean, we're trying to use basically the the projects that we have and the fact that there's a lot of people at home with consumer consumer EEG systems that we could start to you know as proof of concept show how you know this would not necessarily be for mental health now, but this is what could be used for mental health purposes uh, uh, later. And and you know with with not much of a change of focus. Um, well, yeah, that would be that would be good. Maybe you, me, and John, and John also Sean Hill, I think, uh, on that sleep studies and stuff. Um, if we got that thing going between San Francisco and Toronto and MIT, I say Silicon Valley, Toronto and MIT, Cam H, uh, uh, John, what you're doing uh, with what we're, what you and I are doing with Sean Hill, and then roll that in together with. Um, Stanford and MIT and and some other uh, tri campus University of Toronto. Um, sure. sure, I mean that. Yeah, um, Morgan, I can fill you in on the the projects that Steve and I have been putting together in the wearables and mental health front. There's one, there's one small one and one potential big one. Fingers got, crossed. Gotcha. That that sounds that sounds awesome. I mean, you know what what we were trying to to put together with. Um, you know, with some support with OpenBCI, was uh, trying to have something this summer where you know enough people. And so this is one of the things that that I got from the BCI 101 uh, Neurobar was getting to talk with more OpenBCI people, uh, um, developers about what they're really hoping, and they really are hoping that they could get as many of their users as possible to, you know, to, to, to be contributing, uh, you know, e task-based EEG in such a way that we could, you know, group it together and then to start saying things that relate to demographics and, you know, potentially other, other you know, states. Um, but all of that would be dependent on having good normative samples, right? Um, I mean, and and I spent a lot, I spent a lot of time, of course, talking about my favorite Child Mind Institute Healthy Brain Network data set, uh, just in terms of you know that there's there's a mental health project that's really trying to use uh, uh, large scale neuroimaging to to start making a difference in mental health. You know. Yeah, I wonder uh, if we can get some actual funding. Like, like I think we have a good chance. The strategic initiative is about two million a year for the next five years. If we can land that, would be a good start. Uh, in terms of something larger, maybe we could do something. Uh, uh, you know, if if we work with you guys, if we bring in Open BCI, it's going to give us a little bit of, of gravitas. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, it's, it gets a, you know, what do you, what do you necessarily want uh, to say that the wearables are, you know, certainly there's a lot of consumer kits and, you know, what we were talking about uh, with, with them, it was that they have a lot of different hardware too, right? Like, like they don't have just one, one platform, they have a lot. So they've got one channel systems, they got, you know, eight channel systems. Um, and uh, yeah, but I think I think it's. Uh, I mean, I, did you? I did. I don't know if you saw the, the in the chat. I posted the Ninja Nears, which is from um, David Boaz's lab at BU. Uh, I, okay. I'll, I've got that here too. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, there's a lot of good, uh, there's a lot of really good, but the engineers, oh, yeah. But, it, you know, these are, these are what uh, you're totally familiar with in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how to make, how to make wearable systems work. And it's, it's, it's really about the, um, the widespread, or, you know, I think it's about having, in terms of, 
making a difference in mental health. It's, yeah. it's having the normative samples and the. Yeah, that's that would be really that would be fantastic. I'd love to get a bunch of people together, high high functioning, uh, super uh, um, capable uh, makers together, and build and make the future. Let's invent the future. I think if there's enough of us that come together from Stanford, MIT, you know, and also the epicenter of neuroscience, Toronto area stuff. If we can pull all those people together. Sure. Like we've got some really, really unbelievably smart people at Interaxon. It's just phenomenal mm -hmm. level of talent at Interaxon right here in the heart of downtown Toronto, like about a few, just a few minutes walk from my, like out, out the front door of my house here, be over there in a couple of minutes. And well, I'm certainly, I, I got to say, you know, um, I'm, I'm excited to travel again whenever that is available. <laughs> yeah, when, whenever it's possible to travel, do come here to Toronto and check out our world here in terms of brain and deep interfaces. And meanwhile, through social distancing, I mean, we'll do it online. Yes. We'll come up with maybe a roadmap of what the future should hold. We can write something. We can get these ideas out there. We can try and generate collectives or consortia or whatever we need to do to get the community to roll in. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, so, hey, yeah. I just heard from Alex that he'll be able to join in just a minute. Oh, that's super fantastic. Awesome. I'd love to hear from him. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Well, John, I loved it. it. It was good talking with um, uh, with Open BCI. Like they just showed even more interest, and definitely interest in uh, well that that they would like to get as many of their users as possible uh, uh, sharing their data. And so I got a chance to talk with them about you know Data Lad and. Uh, some of the other, you know, the federated learning and the ways ways they could be doing this and right. th things that they would be interested in helping with, even if what we're talking about first is just, you know, uh, uh, saving C C C uh, CV uh, CSV files in some central location, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, a question for me now then is just like, what's the quickest way of getting my hands on an open BCI? <laughs> okay. 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 I want to move quickly on this. Well, I think um, I think that's you know, um, yeah. And so I I did talk to Joe and said like well he was he was a little busy right now, but I think next week that um, Joe would be ready to get back in a loop. And I've got I've got parts of an open BCI from uh, in, from the Neurotech SF, and I'd be happy to loan it out to whoever wants it. So. Um, if you're in San Francisco, no, I mean I'm in Toronto. Unfortunately, I mean, you know. Well, maybe we could maybe we can mail it to you. Toronto, the San Francisco of Canada. <laughs> yeah, well, I I'll see if we can mail it to you. Just just message me. But then, uh, uh, that'd be great. I mean, I, I the to kind of like just fill everyone in, I, and I think. Well, we agreed then from last week and the previous kind of comments is that basically like this this idea is kind of converged to PCI, AG notebooks, ERP, um, multi like mass data gathering exercise, maybe with some um, some competition component of like who who can classify their brain activity. We kind of settled on that. Is that a reason to kind of not not take that as the implicit plan at this point? I, I they they were super. You know, this was like other other people than just Joe, and and you know, I I think there was definitely like some interest in having the steady state Veep. Uh, okay. Possible. You know, so the difference there is that of course they're they're hardware is more configurable so they can give themselves, you know, a good occipital channel. And um, so I think, I think it was really down to like how we feel about a, a broad range of tasks 
where some people would not have electrodes in all the you know best positions, right? Like you wouldn't want people, but 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 uh, honestly, they were they were saying you know, um, yeah. So just just that, and that that I think it wouldn't be necessarily what you could do with your own data, but it would be the the cooler thing would be what you could do with the group data. You know that like everybody who contributes data gets access to the group data. Right. Right. You know, and yep. Yep. and and then you know that's like e emphasizes the power of the group. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you know, I was also um, thinking about um, yeah whether whether some of the kind of like rewards could be um, more like you know contribute. You also get uh, you know some marketing some marketing stuff from OpenBCI. Uh, there's a, there was a woman who runs the quantum computing course uh, or class for um, an Hackaday. She's like product project manager at, at Microsoft, but she runs this on Hackaday, and uh, she has like you know merchandise for those who complete certain certain tasks, uh, uh, software tasks, you know, and it's like you get this mug, <laughs> or you know you get stickers and. Uh, which is a little like the badges you get in Fedora for you know doing certain things and volunteering your time. I I I, I mean I, I want to try and scale OpenBCI's limited marketing budget. <laughs> like not everybody can get necessarily a T-shirt, but um... all right. So maybe the first thing to do is to get a list of names of people who would participate. Well, they they're I mean they're talking about like why like it'll be like sending out as some sort of mailing to open bci users and saying like who's who's down to to who's interested in signing up for it? well maybe i mean like maybe a working group to kind of sure. yeah yeah um, yeah yeah that's online. yeah so i was i mean certainly uh started with joe yourself and Jaden. uh yeah. in terms of like getting the software together and seeing and maybe we could also ask andre in terms of helping with um you know the more hardware the better really yeah I mean, the more people like if we can get five to ten yeah you know people who can just do like a few hours a week like once or twice yeah. um just to chip in um and test stuff i guess but mainly because everything kind of in place with good and stuff like well i mean i think he needed um so he wasn't able to join this week he he, he did he did pass along um some messages sorry i will check but um um i i mean i you know he's only got one one open bci kit himself and there are multiple right like like he's, yeah, but I mean, like, no major development to be done. No, no, no. What's already there, apart yeah. from um, some ideation around what it is trying to achieve. Maybe yeah. a little bit of bit of more kind of setup and yeah, organizational stuff. Yeah, yeah. But it was it was it was great. I mean, at least at least there's another another internal OpenBCI developer that's very on board for for helping with this. And is also particularly interested in these, these you know the the applications that will come next in terms of having having a, a large normative sample and then what you can do with those. All right, let's do it. We'll 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 start the working group and the working group will report back <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> next Thursday. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, uh, so, I I was just. Uh, kind of talking because I wasn't sure if Alex was going to join us. Yeah, Alex is here. Oh. Um, I think he's one of the fellow gisters, though not okay. sure if his mic and is no, working yet. No um, worries. No worries. But on the talk of hardware, I um, was thinking, like, I have to contact the... Project North Star augmented reality headset for a number of things. And I'll mention to them that we might be interested in trying to incorporate 
um, uh, and get some of this type of stuff working on their headsets because I know they're about to release a couple new models um, and a Kickstarter. Um, and because I also know that they have a lot of different ways to mount their um, headset such that it would probably be a lot easier to incorporate it, their headset with these different um, EG headsets, FNIRs, um, OpenEIT, all of that sort of tech because I've tried wearing EG with a number of different commercial headsets and they're all it, uncomfortable enough that you can't focus on anything. Um, and the data, like every time you adjust the face piece for the, a VR headset, it throws the sensors all out of whack and they have to be recalibrated. So um, I'll talk with them about seeing if they, um, if one of the designs I can work on with them is um, one that's specially designed for EG and um, biosensing headsets, pretty much a biosensor variant of their AR headset. So eye tracking, EG, um, pulse oxygenation, or um, oximeters. Um, yeah, so I'll try talking with them about that and see if I can hear back by next week. Well, it's certainly an interesting hardware um, device that I'd love to hear anything you can hear back from about that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's awesome. Wh which ones did you, when you say commercial systems, uh, EEG systems, like consumer? Or, or no, I meant consumer headsets. So yeah. like when um, Micah was doing Dope in EG, or, or the open BCI with the VR headset. We yeah. tried a couple different headsets with that. Um, Oculus Go, Oculus Quest, and um, Mirage Solo were, I think, the three that we got working. But also, you had to put stuff on in a specific order in the same way that, like, I could actually, if I wanted to, I've been doing about half of my Zoom meetings in VR where I'm uh, wearing my VR headset while um, looking at the meeting from within it um, and would love to have other sensors. But also this has a very bad head strap that which like, uh, they said they serve mixed reality dev edition. They said the one that Microsoft gives out for free. Okay. Um, like, we have me, Alex, and like a ton of noise bridgers each went to an event and got one. Okay. And noise bridge has one, noise bridge, like, if, um, but I have a lot of friends with the, um, Project North Star headset since um, I know a lot of the people who originally developed it. And okay. it's so far, I think, the best one in terms of it's AR, but we have a couple ways to modify it to be VR if you want it to be truly immersive. Um, and they finally added a new head strap design that gives room for putting stuff like headphones and different head straps on before the head strap and having them be separate enough that moving that set does not affect um, something like uh, um, any other head mounted devices. Um, but I still think, um, there's ways of improving it, like um, such that the front and rear portions of the um, 
headset where it attached it's held against dead can actually have i'd say the front could probably have four or five sensors in it um and the back could probably have about 10. Mm -hmm. um yeah i think the the lucid i think has like yeah eight in the front or something is that right yeah yeah i mean i also think because uh with the um ar seems to be i think a lot more useful at the moment for having some predefined set of outer things that you can interact with that are much more controlled than how people perceive virtual reality but also this research really needs to be done a lot more in both VR and AR because of how people's cognition changes in both of those situations where you have extra layers of um, sensory input in the same way as if you are a normally hearing person and you put a high power hearing aid in mm. and if you like modify what frequency ranges map to something like a hearing aid so that you can hear things that are higher or lower frequencies than what you normally can mm -hmm. and just see what the world's like when your senses are expanded um Do, and, yeah so I, I was just wondering um in terms of vr headsets what are you are you playing with anything that adds um kind of like additional hand physics uh so um that's one good thing about the project north star headset it, because it was done by leap motion uh, people it has full hand tracking or okay. finger tracking yes um and also it can currently incorporate a um, Intel RealSense T265, um, so you could do inside out, much like um, three dimensional reconstruction. Um, it can work with um, Steam VR directly if mm -hmm. you put a Vive puck on it and turn it into a pretty much a normal a, a AR headset that can play every VR game that's currently released. And it also it's overclockable. Like it was actually the first um, of any of these headsets other than the dedicated high-end AR headsets that could go over 120 hertz. I think the Meta had some prototypes that could go over 120 but my friend made the driver board for project north star and during research we found that for ar you absolutely need to be able to go at least 120 if not more so it can go to 144 and i've been doing research into trying to get um a design that can go about 240 hertz hmm. um but i first want to try to get eye tracking um more accessible in these because i need something that can hold the baseline for what i'm looking at yeah. and whether i'm looking at the real world or the augmented world of items yeah and so far, the only one I've seen that's done a really, really good job of that lately is um, HoloLens 2, yeah. because they have a synchronized projection and eye tracking system. So you can, it can see what item you're focusing on and allow you to interact with a 3D model of it or a virtualized um, uh, 
you can copy something you're looking at just by focusing on looking at it, which they just do through eye tracking. But picture being able to take a screenshot of a three-dimensional object just by thinking, I want to save that item in some virtual like storage or something. Um, yeah, I... So, I mean, I'm just, I mean, how are they doing the, I mean, in North Star, how are they doing the hand physics? Um, so, um, if you know the um, leap motion, they, they is use- that hardware or is it, is it, it's not, it's more than just camera based? It's, it's hardware and software. They aren't using, they're using an IR camera and some IR um, oh. emitters um, okay. and in a sense creating kind of a grid such that um, the problem is there aren't any um, new versions of it that are publicly available hardware wise mm -hmm. since the original one. Though also Leap Motion got bought by um, uh, a haptics company. Um, uh, I'm blanking on it, but they do sonic haptic. Um, so, like, they have a little grid of sonic devices and create, in a sense, three dimensional pressure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, ultra haptics. Um, and Leap Motion, they're now Ultra Leap, is the <laughs> new company name. They they have a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> but yeah, haptics are another thing that um, in VR has started to get decent in the research side of things. I've tried a large number of haptic devices that really do make you interact differently with simulated things, virtual things, um, because there is is still a very known cognitive problem in AR of pressing nothing. You, especially with um, yeah. single planar um, visuals in a lot of the current VR and some AR headsets where you can't actually figure out the exact depth of what you're touching. And because there isn't any response. So research a week or two ago came out about how much you can affect people's cognitive, like how easy they get sick from locomotion in VR and how much haptics can deliberate deliberately cancel that out mm -hmm. um, through putting different haptic taps on like a person's head in a certain spot like while they're walking so that they don't get motion sickness mm -hmm. and um, yeah there's a lot of visual stuff VR has been doing, but they can't figure out exactly why. They just brute force it. Well, it, it where, yeah. Whereas with, if they actually did this stuff with EG or any sort of BCI, it would allow a much clearer picture of what the person is doing and why it might be working. Mm. Um, but mm. They have no headsets to do this testing with that can incorporate all these different things. Gotcha. And also, game developers like me and Alex really want this stuff for games to allow immersion, to allow connection to these games more than just press and click on a mouse. We want you to be able to emote and talk with characters allow you to even if you're in you care a lot about um 
mental health and something that I think has been kind of hurting lately is kids, they don't have much interaction with other people right now. Um, and right now, video games are pretty terrible for interpersonal interactions on a, like, level that's deep enough to connect with people, which it, I think is a lot because things like they eyes are not responsive to you personally. The other characters, you can be, in a sense, find a, a wall of just text and stuff that makes it so your words have no weight to other people in a virtual world sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you also don't have to emote using actual expression, which I think is a problem. Yeah, well, um, I, I want to follow up and... Um... Yeah, it's. Uh, I see that uh, a lot of East Coast people are are bowing out, which I totally understand. Uh, I want to be cognizant of the time. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, so we're gonna follow up, and um, I know. Um, well, so I don't know if if Alex was going to join us. Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Oh yeah, hi. How are you? Good. How is everybody? We're, we're, like hey, Steve. It's How great are you? to connect. It's been so long. We've got to connect again and uh, go by and visit. Yeah, you're uh, in. You're in the lab right now, or at home? Home lab. Uh, so right now I'm in Canada, Toronto, Interaxon, Man Lab. Oh, cool. Um, but yeah, let's let's uh, let's get together. Let's, maybe let's have a conference call or something. You, me, uh, you know, Andre. Um, Whoever you know, just we'll 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 have a just jam session, catch up on all these. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, the last time I was working on a thing uh, at the Nerd Attack Hack Night stuff in SF, I was playing around with kind of uh, an interaction based on Blade Runner's void comp empathy test. Okay. <laughs> Has anybody else ever watched any of the Blade Runner stuff and thought, man, that that'd be a fun to build? Yeah. yeah. Um, so at the time, I was playing around with uh, an SDK called Affectiva, which is a free face emotion sort of uh, sort of uh, tracking package. It gives you like a zero to a hundred scale for facial expressions and emotions. Is that Rosalind Picard's company? I'm not sure. Uh, Affectiva. Okay, but anyway, it worked. It worked well enough for certain facial expressions to be pretty reliable, like smiling mm -hmm. and frowning. And my original prototype was just: it asks you, "How are you feeling?" And it looks just like a regular point-and-click kind of like a dialogue tree. The difference is that it responds based on whether your face matches your words. So if you, this is the very simple prototype I showed was: if you, if it said, "How are you feeling?" And you said, I'm fine, but you were smiling with a big smile. And I ask you something like, well, you seem like better than fine. It's, it's like it's something new going on in your life or like, you know, why are you feeling, why are you looking so upbeat? If you are frowning or just like really um, unemotional and you say fine, it might say something like, are you really fine? Like, is there more to the story? Do you want to talk about what's been going on in your life? Sure, sure. So it was a very simple premise. Just... Could you kind of make a little bit of a, an automated personality interaction thing, which was using what your face was showing to second guess what you're saying? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at, uh, I'm just trying to find a, a reference. Um, so Sasha Ghosh uh, at MIT did a, a review article of um, speech, speech processing for, for psychiatric diagnosis. Um, mm -hmm. and which, you know, your, your Blade Runner, uh, sort of reminded me that, I mean, he does a lot of neuroimaging too. He just happened to do this particular, uh, uh 
review article that I thought was really good. Um, yeah. So wh when when was that uh, that you were at uh, Hack Night? Uh, I think it was about a year ago. Oh, okay. Um, cool. And at the time, people were showing something really cool at the uh, at the garage door uh, location in SF. It was like okay. a under under of a building with a garage. Yeah, no, that was that Marion and Will's Will's yeah. garage. Yeah, yeah, Marion was there, okay. and they were showing some cool stuff to take different kinds of inputs um, from different types of sensors and to kind of aggregate it into a way that's easier to tie it all together and program it and track it and record it and stuff. Was that her her cloud brain project? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was kind of what what I was thinking is is so there's there's two things involved in what I had envisioned for that prototype to eventually become. And I, if if there were other people interested in doing some stuff or already doing some stuff, I was trying to kind of find people who were already doing that basically. But I was just thinking, um, you know, the chance of us finding a replicant is pretty low. <laughs> But people do all sorts of fun things with sort of Turing tests and reverse Turing tests. Um, and the idea of, of having a kind of like a psychological interaction with a, with the machine as a helper in Blade Runner was also done where there are two humans sitting across from each other and the machine is just an assistant. So if the machine is assisting a human psychologist who's talking to another human, it's giving the human possible analysis or insight or suggestions and probably it'll be hilariously useless and much worse than regular human intuition and judgment about body language and so on at first but it would still be funny to see what the closest thing to that i think in sci-fi i've seen was in uh, the deus ex games you could get an upgrade for your cyber brain in the deus ex uh, sort of cyberpunk games <laughs> where you'd be talking to a character like a terrorist who you're negotiating with and it would give you like an it would give you an insight into what their their body language is is hiding like, oh, they're bluffing here, you know, with a 72% chance. But it wasn't guaranteed to be reliable because these indicators are not, you know, not, uh, not, brain, not brain reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I'm sure you're, you're, you're familiar with the next couple of Sorry, I got Sorry, I got this. I hear some of your sounds. Uh, uh, Microsoft, Microsoft, Microsoft kind of give you that uh, emotional, emotional label. That's quite the amount of feedback. Yeah, sorry. yeah. I don't know if it was that's the feedback. It's not me. Uh, let's see. There's. I can't tell who has the feedback. Yeah, yeah I, I remember at that meeting a couple of years ago, I brought this, a pulse oximeter, um, uh, that I wanted to try to synchronize with the um, uh, emotive uh, um, stuff that Alex was working out on, because I I really think that the more of these sensors integrated and able to be synchronized, the more this data could at least lead to some relations between different aspects of the data, things like a kind of logical assumption would be things like heart rate and eye tracking being a, or no, heart rate, rate and EMG being able to theoretically check your, if you're scared or excited through knowing if you have a high pulse rate and are relaxed, you're probably excited. While if you're scared, it would be a high pulse rate and you have muscles that are under more tension. 
Um, but there's also a chance that there could be no correlation between things like that. And I really think it would have to rely on more sensors to be able to understand things like that. And the brain would be pretty much the most critical piece of that puzzle because it could be kind of the fallback of what is active and is that has that thing been active when this person is feeling a certain way um and can we predict stuff with that or like does facebook depress them <laughs> <laughs> very simple correlations <laughs> Well, I, I mean, so, you know, not to, you know, this is, this is a hard problem, right? I mean, this, this kind of, uh, effective, um, you know, effective labeling is, uh, is not easy to do and is also, you know, somewhat behind, uh, you know, I mean, lie detection systems, the, the kind of measures that you're taking there, you know, are, are, you know, lie detection doesn't use EEG typically, right? Um, and uh, and it, it's 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 hard. <laughs> it's hard to to get all those together. I think I think I, actually adding adding the the video and things like that would probably definitely help. Um, but the speech I, I I put in a link to the Satra's review article on the speech processing. Um, that uh yeah i mean as you know with all the with all the money and tech that has gone into speech processing recently i think there's some some really interesting things you can do with that um i still want to be uh well um it's great to have you um is there anything you're working on alex that uh you want to talk about um, currently, I'm working on a VR chat based project. Gotcha. Um, and it's with some other people, and it's making like something for collaboration and meetings and stuff. Gotcha. Um, VR chat though is really not very good. Like it's it's very minimal viable metaverse for memes. It's not suitable for any of the things Second Life could do. Even it doesn't have really? a, like a real time scriptable language. Yeah. But it is at least kind of a testing ground. Um, we've met some other folks with better prototyping systems like the uh, Janus VR folks who came to Noisebridge and mapped it with their Tango phones. Gotcha. And the, the scan they were doing with their Tangos was real time showing up inside of, uh, Janus. Inside of Janus. Hmm. And the Janus was running off of their phone. The local phone they had was the server for it. So hmm. they were broadcasting a metaverse signal, so to speak in real time from a device while they were building the world from the place they were actually physically at. Um, so I'm excited about metaverse sort of uh, world technologies and none of the ones that exist right now that I've used so far um, are quite where we would like them to be such that this meeting would be happening in those instead. But it seems like trying to put more of us into like those of us who are uh, explorers of those things into one or more of those things at these meetings, sort of experimentally, and trying to hold meetings there, um, not just in VRChat, but in any of these things. Like we, we could try a different one, um, perhaps for each meeting, separate from the main meeting, but just kind of kind of like a uh, alternate meeting uh, metaverse uh, test session. Um, that would be really cool. And I'm interested in seeing if we could combine the stuff that you can do with uh, faces, like uh, emotion tracking and being able to see each other mm -hmm. with having a virtual world. Because right now those are, like Brian was saying, he would wear his headset while he's in a Zoom meeting. And those are treated as mutually exclusive. Either you can see a, a cool 3D world, but no one's real face is there, or yeah. everyone can see each other's face in a bunch of rectangles. Yeah. Um, so a lot of these headsets, you can kind of like pop them upwards. So I was thinking it might make sense to be able to have like a person who's speaking just kind of like pop their headset upwards and have the camera on their computer so that everyone could see their face while they're talking and then pop it down when they're done speaking or something like that. 
I, I, I know that there's definitely been more work in terms of making making a face move with a, a speech stream, you know, like given a person's yeah. speech stream and given a given a 3D model uh, to to make that person's, you know, I I don't know if it would add that emotion. Yeah. Um, it's gotten pretty close. If you look up what a VTuber is, which is the, a virtual YouTuber, these are 3D avatar-based characters and stuff, and it's actually pretty surprising the amount of personal interaction you're able to have with these 3D avatars just from very simple a very simple set of mouth, eye and um, eyebrow movements, um, and also very basic full body tracking. Like, um, I mean, a number of these people have gone very big. He's in the eye, and right now, the most famous new one is called Project Melody, which is a... 3D avatar, um, like, not virtual reality, but just 3D avatar cam girl. And she actually has broken a number of video sites because of how popular she's become on some of those sites. Um, and, um... But there's been a lot of work in to try to make 3D avatars something people can relate to. And we're pretty close to the point where people can have multiple identities, including a VR identity or a like 3D avatar um, identity but also they can change it. If you go in VR chat, people have hundreds of their own avatars that they change between, depending on how they feel. Um, and that's something that can allow for a different form of expression than what you currently can do in the regular non-VR world. Um, Okay. Well, so just uh, want to be again cognizant of time here. Um, I know I've got a four-year-old who is um, expecting. I've made made promises about ice cream that I don't know if I can put off any longer. Um, so, uh, Morgan, as far as I'm aware, as far as I can tell, all you feed your children is ice cream. <laughs> is ice cream. All right. <laughs> I want to say that this is not a perfectly random sample of of my home life that you are <laughs> getting, but uh, there there's an inordinate amount of ice cream. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, sweet sweets have certainly started to take over. Um, we're we're trying to do anything we can to survive here. Uh, hey, I, Morgan, I, yeah. I had a quick question for Ryan. Um, yeah. Uh, what he was describing, the virtual avatar has changed with your mood. H have you watched the BBC show Years and Years? I've heard of it. I have not seen it yet. So you should you should take a look. I mean, the premise is cheesy, but one of the characters is, you know, the kind of the rebellious teenager. She wears a permanent um, projected, basically, emotion emoji face um that, you know, she uses uh, so that they explore the kind of concept of trying to hide your identity or to present a different outward identity by basically changing this virtual representation of yourself. Um, so I think you'd, you'd find some of that interesting, even though it's it's a bit of a, um, you know, drama of a show. Uh, I mean, like, a lot of this, like, the perspective I have on a lot of this is from the anime and manga um, and comics community because I watch and read a lot of... Um, full dive VR stories. Like I have a extremely massive list of every um, 
anime and manga that deals with things like cognition and um, virtual reality. What would happen if we have full dive virtual reality where all your senses are transferred? Um, what happens to you, worlds if you if that's incorporated into everyday society where you can't tell what parts of it are real or actually they all become real because cognitively they are no different than each other. So the idea of what is a virtual world and what is a real world is becomes a moot point because everything is real to from your perspective and it's more a question of which one are you focused on um yeah so i've been starting to write about some of this stuff in a like fiction idea but yeah it's there's a lot happening right now and it's really cool i'll present on it at some point cool um so just a couple a couple of things you you guys don't need to, to you don't need to stop um i want to get at uh, a few news items um that are somewhat relevant um i so check check the meetup agenda um uh certainly i didn't know if this would be relevant john um, but the uh, OHBM Open Science Room, um, I don't know if you saw this, um, but they're taking taking submissions and the deadline is tomorrow, um, which I know is like, <laughs> is tomorrow. Um, but I didn't know if other people had seen the, the Open Science Room and whether we thought anything that we were doing would be a... Um, you know, a worthy, you know, anything that we were doing under kind of Neurotech X umbrella would be um, worth uh, uh, considering. And and my my reference in the in the agenda is actually making sure that people are also on the brain hack matter most because um, there's a number of good there's a number of good channels on the brain hack matter most uh you know discussion server and you know so one you can follow the the neuromatch academy or well you can follow neuromatch and you know conrad cording's uh the the unconference that's coming may 25th to 27th and then of course neuromatch academy which is going to be this summer mid july <laughs> something for about three weeks and um uh, so you can follow that channel, but there's also, you know, if you if you are on BrainHack's uh, discussion server, you can also follow uh, the OHBM Hackathon. So this is the um, Human Brain Mapping Conference, which is going to be online. And um, so I, I wanted to bring that up. Um, absolutely love uh, all the the guests today and um, I'm not worried at all that uh, about our agenda but but there was a, good, a couple of good links in there and um, uh, so if if there's anything to follow up that you think would be interesting John just let me know or, uh, or you know yeah like thanks for pointing that out I didn't know about it actually um, and, well, I'm sorry I'm pointing it out the, the night before. No, nah, um, you know. I think I think basically not this year, but maybe yeah. next year. Gotcha. But, you know, it's pretty new imaging oriented and you know, a lot of the projects uh, are on that list are kind of like... I haven't even seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's nothing EEG or nothing FNIRS or... Uh, nothing is springing, nothing jumping out. Okay. Um, but in any case, like... Maybe maybe this time next year we have a really really solid EG notebook that we want to kind of present to OHBM in a systematic way. We could consider something like that in general. Well, I mean, I guess it would also just be a good. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether there's anything that we'd want to try and get 
OHBM people interested in helping with in yeah. a hackathon? I mean, generally speaking, I think that that I typically it's, like say like that's a really good idea because those folks are generally you know, keen on doing stuff and they do the kind of, they do like the kind of things we do. Yeah, I mean, I was I was just wondering if if there would be extra interest just because everybody knows that it's going to be a while before they'll be able to actually get subjects back in a lab uh, connected to their more expensive equipment. Yeah. Right. I mean, okay. like sort of following like, you know, Mika Allen's, uh, you know, like, hey, I'm going to start doing introspection work at home. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> Like, like, how do I get this to, to, you know, everybody who's at home now, you know, in the same way that, that you were talking about, uh, uh, like, this is what we need to do. Like, do you have a headset? <laughs> yeah. Be, I, you, I think it's a cool idea. I think maybe we'll kind of yeah. pummel the neuroimaging community with that message. We, we could think about. Sure. Sure. Making that pitch, but maybe not necessarily trying to squeeze it into this event. Sure. Gotcha. So just wanted to bring that up. Um, and and again, like, you know, one of the reasons that I, I saw that, uh, I mean, partly because I was going to at least be a volunteer for the, the hackathon. Um, so I don't know if everybody saw, I mean, I'll post the video that the um, the people running the open science room posted, um, but yeah, get on, get on brain hack. I mean, the, the nice thing I'm already seeing, um, you know, messages that I sent people, uh, have disappeared from Slack and like, I've only been, you know, active for the, like the last, I don't know, three months. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I mean, the great thing again about matter most is that those messages don't disappear. So um, still in, in a great place to also connect with. I'm in the 42 channel uh, and on um, BrainHack, um, which is of course the name of the the coding school in Paris that was going to host the Time Flux hackathon that you know got canceled right when lockdown was happening. Um, so again, just just a quick push on that. Um, of course, uh, Nylearn Dev Days uh, is next week, so nineteenth to the twenty second, I think. And um, you know, so you've got this, you know, from the same people who brought you Scikit Learn, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and right now they're just getting into uh, the incorporation of nice stats and and first level fMRI processing into their you know entire machine learning pipelines uh, and other reproducibility uh, metrics and generalizability metrics and uh, and it's a great development community to be a part of and you know to learn your your neuroimaging um, uh, we would love to be, you know, love to see Moab and, you know, become like the, the Nylearn of EEG in some, in some fashion or, you know, with extensions um, and, and NEARS. And, and uh, as, as we've seen, you know, m &E has uh, already got some F NEARS processing, but, um, you know, in some ways you could, you could use Nylearn as well. And um, <laughs> so uh, always on the lookout for uh, people interested in presenting something for next week. Uh, I said, when I come out, can you keep the door closed until then? <laughs> you should go get her some ice cream. I, I, I took <laughs> a, it's, it's 9, 10. Um, uh, so if there's anybody on who potentially wanted to talk about, uh, vagus nerve stimulation, uh, in the, in the next couple of weeks, um, I'd be, you know, get in touch and I'd be interested to put you on the schedule. <laughs>
I'm not, no pressure. I'm not saying that person is, is here right now. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I'd love to. Okay. Or, um, right now, my lab and I are doing this um, pilot for telerehabilitation, especially with the uh, COVID-19. We're testing our uh, neurorehabilitation neuro device. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm more than happy to give a little bit of the preclinical studies for VNS as well as um, where we're going with our devices as well. Yeah, I mean, if, if you don't, if you don't mind, or you know, if it's easy, because yeah. well, you've seen how you know we're we're informal, but uh, um, an intro would really help. I mean, like like that kind of the kind of work that you're doing is is a bit new to you know at least you know. People who are only familiar with, say, the consumer EEG devices and things like that. No, so, yeah, so. that, I'd love that too. You know, so, yeah. okay. um, I already have a talk. I already have cool. a talk. That's like about thirty minutes or so. And so that, if I can go into the preclinical work. Yeah. Uh, the translational. My work is more clinical translation awesome. uh, and pairing of neural tech with yeah. uh, vagus nerve so, Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, great. So um, I think that's I think that's that for this week. Um, uh, any anybody want to f add some updates on other things that I'm not uh, tracking? Well, I definitely want to uh, also plug uh, Paris uh, Meetup for. Um, uh, Monday, uh, 6 p.m. or Central uh, European time. Um, please join us, and we're going to have Luc uh, uh, Luc Jean Veux, uh speak about um, open source ultrasound and his uh, his project that you can find on Hackaday. Uh, it's really cool, um, and perhaps and and more. Um, but uh, for those that are available, uh, at least in North America, you know, kind of morning, noon, uh, uh, North America time, you can join us uh, for same hack night uh, Paris. And um, yeah, I'm going to go make a, a small girl very happy with ice cream. So until next week, um, we'll, we'll hopefully get to see some uh, 